Sometimes it can be a very fun conversation to go down the rabbit hole on topics that nobody really knows what the 100% truth is. Topics such as ancient civilizations, UFOs, extraterrestrials, all that kind of stuff. Nobody really knows. So we brought on our next guest, Billy Carson. A lot of you know who that is, to have a speculative conversation about these subjects and what Billy's opinion is on how some of these ancient civilizations were formed, some of the technologies they may have had. It's a fascinating conversation, but it is speculative. Keep that in mind. If you like the show, head over to Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Please leave us a review. Tell us how we're doing. Tell us who you'd like to see on the show. If you're watching this on YouTube, please like, comment, and subscribe. Patreon, if it wasn't for you, this show wouldn't even be possible. Thank you. You're our top supporters. We love you. We do love you all too, though. So, everybody, enjoy the show, and I'll see you soon. Billy Carson, welcome to the show, man. Great. It's great being here. From the first time I met you and you said you'd like to have me here, I'm glad it happened. Me too, man. I've, I've been wanting to get you here way before we met, and I actually got to tell you in person I wanted you here. I, wanted, yeah. I started watching you. Actually, I think I first found you on one of Dr. Greer's ah, documentaries. Okay. And I really liked what you were saying on there. So then I found it on social, started following you and listening wow. to what you were saying, watched a bunch of your podcasts. And yeah. your knowledge on the pyramids, just all of, I guess, what you call it, ancient history mm -hmm. is just incredible. Thank it's you. fascinating. Thank you. So yeah, appreciate it. So let me give you a quick intro here real quick. <laughs> Billy Carson, you're the president of For Forbidden Knowledge, Inc., Childhood Interest. You started researching aerospace at age seven. You hold a certificate study of science and neuroscience at MIT, ancient civilization at Harvard. You've researched the Emerald Tablets, the Key of Time, remote viewing, ancient Egypt, yeah. all kinds of stuff. Yeah. And uh, you are definitely a resident expert on all these topics. So something that I've been digging into and... You know, it all kind of stemmed. I think a lot of this stuff stemmed. We talked before, but yeah. a lot of this stuff stemmed after my first psychedelics yeah. uh, experience. And and um, it just took me down these rabbit holes. And yeah. <laughs> I'm realizing we've been lied to about a lot of different things. Mm, and yes. uh, especially ancient Egypt. Absolutely. So <clears throat> I got a... Question from a patron of mine, Patreon. We got a subscription account that's what enables me to do this, yeah. and uh, and you to sit here as well. And so mm -hmm. I like to give them a question. Here it is. This is from Alex Tissot. What does Billy make of the resurgence in interest? The resurgence in interest in what we are seeing now with the UFOs and UAPs. Oh yeah. Huge question, huge topic right now, obviously, with uh, the Pentagon coming forward, people testifying before Congress. Even right now, you see active military people be able to make a statement as to what's going on out there versus before, you know, just 10 years ago, it was only veterans that could make a statement. Mm -hmm. And so what you see right now is this resurgence of this new UFO, now UAP information, but I think it's a, 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 an issue to control the narrative. It's their agenda. They want to control what's going on, what the people actually hear, what they see, what they understand about the UFOs and now UAPs. And one of the main reasons why, I think it all has to do with money. You see, I believe that there are UFOs visiting Earth from outside of this planet. That, the ancient tablets talk about this over eons. However, right now, all of a sudden, it's becoming common knowledge and openly stated as if just matter-of-factly by the U.S. government. Why is that? Well, we now have the Space Force. And why do we have the Space Force? Well, we have the Space Force because we have to find a way to make more money. All the wars have been fought. Who are we going to go invade? Who are we going to bring democracy to now? We've literally invaded almost every continent on the planet. We've done our thing. And now the next big uh, rush for super, super wealth is space. 
So you have to now control this UAP narrative and you have to now say, hey, these things pose a potential threat to our national security, global security. We know that they've shown up at missile silos and they've shown up at these flights where they have the, the nuclear uh, you know, missiles and they've deactivated the nuclear codes. So what does that mean? Well, guys, listen, that if they can deactivate them, maybe they can activate them, maybe they can even launch them. This is the seeds that they're planting in people's head without quite saying it, just the manipulation of word and the manipulation of applied neuroscience. They know how, to, they know how frequencies operate in the human consciousness. So now when they come to say, hey, we need to divert X amount of trillions of dollars to this space force to develop space weaponry and to defend this planet against a threat, everyone's going to be all aboard. Hey, let's go. Let's do it. Before they were taking money and they were doing it illegally. They were transferring trillions of dollars illegally into black budget spending and then having no accountability and nobody knew where the money went. You know, Oliver North is testifying before Congress, say, I don't know where the money went. We're going to have to do some kind of a computing thing. Our computers aren't working properly. We couldn't work with your, your, your system, he told Cynthia McKinney one time. But now, all of a sudden, it's okay. Look, here's where the money went. We put it right over here because we're developing the stuff. Then you give the contracts to private corporations. Now, the people who sign off on these private corps to get these contracts, they're also on the board of directors or they have family members on the board of directors of these private corporations. So what's happening is they're taking it out of government to private. Why? Because now there's no FOIA, no Freedom of Information Act is going to be requested. You can't request Freedom of Information Act on a private corp. So now these private corp get trillion dollar contracts to build and develop space technologies that the rest of the world will never see, never know of. Won't, we won't even know they exist. We'll just know where the money went and that's the end of that. They'll take big payouts. A lot of these projects will never see the light of day. Most of them will be projects that are born to fail from the beginning. So they'll take a contract. We're going to develop this device or this aerospace tech. And then we'll need uh, $5 billion to start. Two years later, well, we need another 6 to $7 billion. It didn't quite work right. Another five, six more years later, send us another $8 billion. We almost got it now. And then another 10 years, maybe a few more billion. And oh, we're going to scratch this. It's not going to work. But everybody got the payouts along the way. People got big salaries. Big, uh, you know, CEOs and C-suite executives took home big umbrella payments. And now let's move on to the next project that we're never going to put out. And so this is the kind of cycle. But doing it this way through controlling the UAP narrative allows them to siphon trillions of dollars into these private black budget projects that are com operating with complete no, uh, no congressional oversight. You know, I've not heard that before, but it makes perfect sense. And uh, I've, <clears throat> I've been wondering... <laughs> why this is starting to see the light of day more and more. But yeah. the fact that, I mean, just to break it down simple, everything that you just said, basically what you're saying is the only reason this is happening is so that they can legalize the black budgets. That's it. P pretty much. That is it. Do you think there's going to be any, I mean, it does sound like that they are, at least at the congressional hearing, it sounds like they want more oversight over companies like Raytheon, Skunk yeah. Works, uh, Boeing, Northrop Grumman, these these type of mm -hmm. the military industrial complex companies. Yeah. Do you think that they will achieve any type of oversight? I mean, I've, I've been, Tim Burchett is mm -hmm. on top of it. Anna yeah. Paulina Luna seems to be on top of it. Yeah. Um, and it's the only, I went to that hearing mm -hmm. and it's the only hearing that I've, in recent times where you yeah. saw the right and the left come together and, yeah. and it was actually kind of nice. To, mm -hmm. It was very nice to see. Absolutely. Do you think that they'll have any success? I think we have oversight? to keep putting pressure. I think that success uh, won't be instantaneous, but I do think that with enough pressure, we can, be, we can begin to see a prog some progress and also some parameters being set as to what they can and can't get away with. And it's going to take some infiltration, some people working from the inside out. Uh, you know, in other words, you know, people from the inside of government and, and key positions of power, they say, you know, enough is enough. We're going to change this. People who aren't willing to take the payoffs, people who aren't scared of these private corporations threatening them or their families, because that's what happens from time to time, which keeps the whole ball rolling for these corps. So it's going to take some really brave people in positions of power to stop this and actually allow this open book situation to, to happen. Man, I just... That just, just that conversation <laughs> right there. Just, I know this is going to be an awesome interview. So before we start, everybody gets a gift. Oh, wow. 
Hey, thank you, sir. Appreciate there it. Go. There, there you go. Man. So <clears throat> when we met at Greer's event, yeah. we had talked about consciousness and we yeah. had talked a little bit about psilocybin and, yeah. and the influx of, you know, psychedelic therapy and stuff. Mm -hmm. But that led me down functional, looking into functional mushrooms and okay. the benefits of functional mushrooms. Oh, nice. So we, Check it out. so I got you, this is from Laird Superfood. That's performance mushrooms. Wow. Beautiful. And you know, it's just good for brain health, helps with yeah. cognition, helps with energy balance. Beautiful. And that's a superfood creamer that also has a bunch of functional mushrooms. I use this. Do you really? This is great. You love that stuff. I love then. this stuff. We take this out, we take this to Egypt with us because there's no cream in the desert. Yeah. But you can get coffee. So we put this in as cream and we yeah, this is beautiful. Oh, Thank perfect. You, man. You're and I'm going to Egypt in a couple of weeks. <laughs> You're welcome. That's awesome. Listen, right on. Listen, man. The universe knows what I love. <laughs> we'll get you some more then. But, yeah, thank you. But yeah, and you know, the other thing that all of those in the performance mushrooms, all of those mm -hmm. ingredients are sourced here in the U.S. Yeah. So you don't hear that very often. No, you don't. Yes. But, um, no, appreciate it, man. <laughs> my pleasure. My pleasure. <clears throat> but um, all right, so let's get into it. Yeah. Uh, one thing that I did want to ask you mm -hmm. is the more I dive into this subject... And I'm I'm green with this stuff. Yeah. You know, I've been talking, you know, I've talked to Greer. I've had oh, yeah. him on the show two times mm -hmm. and um, had the whistleblowers on. Mm -hmm. The more I dive into this subject and I yeah. start looking at who's involved, I, I'm starting to see a lot of these, a lot of Freemasons. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's what's the deal with the Freemasons? I hear well, a lot of <laughs> it's a lot. stuff. There's a lot. There's a vast array of information there's only a, a few real Freemasons that exist. In other words, when I say a few, I'm talking about maybe a few hundred, maybe at the you know at the top level that really really know the ancient secrets, right? Okay. A lot of, there's masonry uh, halls all around the United States. Mm -hmm. I just spoke at one in Detroit. I was doing a conscious lecture with the uh, 19 Keys. We had nothing to do with masonry, but that's what you know they rented the hall out to make money. But the people that generally typically go there, they have no real knowledge of the real ancient wisdom and knowledge that goes back into the ancient past. A lot of cities, even the city I grew up in, has these Freemason halls where it's just like a place to congregate, hang out, have a barbecue, pick up women, dance. There's no real true deep knowledge being translated at a lot of these places. Okay. There's only a very small, and I do mean small amount of people that really house and hold the true knowledge of the ancient past as the top level Freemasons. Wh when did this start? Yeah, this goes all the way back to deep, deep antiquity. We're talking about 30,000 plus years ago, there were these brick masons in ancient Kemet called the Shatu. After the great flood, Amun-Ra, AKA Marduk, he's known as Marduk in the Bible, M-A-R-D-U-K. Some people say Marduk, depending on how you want to pronounce his name. He's also in the Jewish Torah as well. Uh, in Kemet, he was known as Amen-Ra. This is why people say Amen, actually, it's to him. He actually made it a, a, a rule, a law. But he had these brick masons helping him rebuild the land of Kem. And these brick masons had the secret knowledge of space flight technologies, how to turn stone structures into advanced computer, uh, computer housing, data storage devices, as well as power generators and many other functions. A lot of the stone structures that were built were actually multifunctional stone computers. If you're going to a place with, when you only have limited resources that you can't take a factory and a whole bunch of workers with you, what do you do? You learn how to work with what's there. And they mastered stone masonry, but they also encoded and embedded a lot of the wisdom and knowledge from the ancient Egyptian mysteries and the Kemetic mysteries into the structures. Now these Freemasons were called Shatu. As a matter of fact, the Shatu helped Amun-Ra escape. In the last, there was a pyramid war. There were two pyramid wars. The second pyramid war in the tablets talks about the fact that the Shatu helped uh, helped uh, Amun-Ra escape through a hidden passage in one of the pyramids. And before he left, he decreed that he he would leave the kingdom to his Ra Kam. Ra Kam K A M translates now into shield. Kam translates into shield. Ra shield. Over time, it became Rothschilds. And so this decree came down tens of thousands of years ago. Who's the richest, richest family on the planet worth $700 trillion combined income, net worth? The Rothschilds. It's still it's happening till this very, very day. And this masonry 
It's part of the mysteries, the mystery schools. Only adept initiates, handpicked people would get to learn this sacred knowledge. And then the Masons would actually encode it into structures and buildings, which is encoded all throughout the world, throughout Rome at the Vatican, uh, all throughout Europe, all throughout uh, uh, by areas like in Bosnia, believe it or not, where you have the Pyramid of the Sun there in the Bosnian Valley. How would they pick who gets the knowledge? They literally had a system in which they can identify people who they called adept initiates, people who seem to have some type of um, ability to perceive things at a higher level or retain knowledge at a higher level or display some type of talent you know, or ability. And those people were literally handpicked. Yeshua, a.k.a. Jesus, was one of these students as well. If you look at the, read the Gospel of the Holy Twelve, you'll find that when he disappeared from the Bible, where did he go? He went to Egypt. I've taken many people to the actual bed that he slept in, which is still there in Egypt. It's a shrine now. And he was there learning the Egyptian mysteries. Uh, and this is well known, well documented. I mean, that was an apocryphal text that was left out of the Bible. He left there and went to Tibet to learn uh, Reiki healing and Qigong and energy healing with his hands. And came down through India, learned the mystic arts. And then the Bible picks up at the age of 32, I called my son out of Egypt. That's what the Bible says. And he mm. ends up riding it on the back of a donkey back in Jerusalem. So that's the loop that's missing out of there, 12 to 32. That chunk is missing out of, in the gospel of the Holy 12. Again, he also was, had the Mason knowledge. Now, the thing about knowledge is it can be used for good or it can be used for evil. You see, knowledge is just knowledge. If you, know, if you have a gun and I have a car and you're trained on how to use a gun ap appropriately, which you are, right? Mm -hmm. Well, you know how to use it, when to use it. You know, you, because your mind is clear, you're not going to use it on anybody just because you want to. You're, you're actually trained to hit enemy targets or to save civilians, right? Don't, don't shoot civilians. I have a car. I have no training. I'm, I'm using ignorant knowledge, and I'm just angry. I can take my car, and I can kill people just by driving my car right down the sidewalk. I can wipe out a ton of people. And you could be walking on that same sidewalk with a gun, and you kill nobody. But you have the knowledge, and I don't. So just a, a little bit of a metaphor there. Mm -hmm. It's nothing to do with the knowledge. It has to do with how it's applied. And so a lot of people have taken ancient wisdom and ancient knowledge when they discovered how powerful it was and how it can control masses of people and allow you to supersede them economically and, and, and everything else. Um, and they decided to use it for darkness, for negativity, for, for, for power-hungry uh, type struggles and so forth. And so... We have a situation where, unfortunately, a lot of these um, secret societies, Skull and Crossbones and Illuminati and all these things that exist, they all stem from ancient mystery schools and then developed into these subordinate dark uh, entities that are now running the planet with Thoth calls, Thoth from the Emerald Tablets, he calls them the Dark Brothers. Okay. But all these people were Masons. Interesting. So are they, they're not good guys? For the most part, not that good. Now, there are some that I actually personally know that are actually great people. Okay. Again, yin and yang, good and evil, exist throughout the entire universe. It permeates everything. Some people actually utilize it for the knowledge and the wisdom that it is and have kept it as secret and sacred knowledge. Some people that utilize it to find a way to put their boot on other people's necks, unfortunately. But that's just the, the universe we live in. There's this dichotomy of good and evil everywhere. Um, but the ultimate force behind the highest level of Mason knowledge has to do with reclaiming our birthright to space travel. You see, in the ancient tablets, there was a situation where this, uh, the Atlantean civilization had spread around the entire planet. Atlantis were, was built by these Anunnaki people according to the ancient tablets, not according to me. And these, these families had factions and they were fighting each other. They went to war against each other many times. And in one case, this one faction or one side of the family came against another. And because they lost the battle, they were banished to be, to, be, to be locked and, and you know, stuck pretty much on Earth and never to achieve space travel again. And so they were the original founders of this knowledge of masonry to hide the knowledge of space travel and advanced knowledge and wisdom and physics and everything else into stone buildings and stone structures. Over time, we have slowly, slowly regained our right to get back into space, and we now have done it, obviously. In the last 100 years, we went from a horse, buggy, and carriage to putting remote control cars on Mars. We even have Voyager 1 and 2, which are about to head into interstellar space. So what does that mean? We, we found it out. In Florida, there's only one runway at the Space Coast. It's runway number 33. Why 33? It's a Mason symbol. Why 33 Mason symbol? Well, in order to travel in space, in order to break Earth's gravity, to get past what they call max Q and transition into outer space, 
You have to travel 33 times the speed of sound or you will not get there, you see? Anything less, you fall back. You'll stall out and you'll actually crash. 33 times the speed of sound is required to get into space. And the whole thing behind why the number 33, it's all about reclaiming the birthright to be able to become a spacefaring race again. Interesting, interesting. Let's move into, actually, what are these ancient tablets? What caught your interest at the beginning? Why'd you start studying them? Well, I had an experience when I was younger as a kid, which is, you know, I'll, I'll cut the story short, but I had an experience in my backyard. I lived near, near a, a private airport, and I used to watch the airplanes go over my house. And this one day, this object went across the horizon that cleared the horizon in seconds, not minutes. And I knew that it wasn't a plane. It didn't have a cockpit, you know, wings. It didn't have tail fin, none of that stuff. And it was completely silent and it was like a, a, a silverish glowing metal. Then it came back much lower and then it stopped dead smack over about now 200 meters, I can estimate now as a grown man. And then it went pew, out the way it came in. And I went from that point. That's why I got into aerospace you know, research. I started getting all the Encyclopedia Britannica, because this is back in 1977, <laughs> on aerospace. Started studying from then, uh, trying to find what I saw. Long story short, that led me into a whole nother realm, which then got me into ancient civilizations, which then I started seeing that these ancient civilizations were utilizing high technology. And I've been studying high tech. Well, how in the world did they have high tech back then? And my mother told me that in ancient times, there were people that were way more advanced than us on this planet. They had everything you can possibly think of. She said they had the ability to fly from planet to planet. They lived on top of mountains. And everything she told me in the 70s, I started finding in these ancient texts. So the texts are the Enuma Elish and the Seven Tablets of Creation, the Atrahasis Epic, the Code of Hammurabi, the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is the full and true story of Noah's Ark. Uh, Noah is actually the Zudra from the, uh, from the Sumerian tales. Later, his name is converted into Noah. Um, and then you have the, uh, so many tablets. I mean, there's just so many uh, incredible tablets that are out there. And also some of these are like from the Mahabharata, the Bhagavad Gita, the Indian Vedas, um, which is a, a vast amount of wisdom and knowledge right there. The, the Mahabharata itself is a 10 book set that's all been translated already. Uh, and there's just so many other tablets that exist that you can get your hands on and they're all translated. They've been translated since the 1800s. If people think this Zachariah Sitchin was the only person that can translate tablets and now he's dead and you know he made it all up. No, he used existing translations and he even gives you his sources in the back of all his books. He didn't translate anything. You can go to the UCLA CDLI online cuneiform digital library. Say that fast four times. <laughs> and you can drop <laughs> virtual tablets into the translator and read them for yourself. No kidding. Yes. So everyone can read these tablets. You don't have to be a special expert like Billy Carson. Now everyone can read what's on these tablets and make up their own educated decision on what they believe happened in the ancient past. And what did happen, now with hundreds of authors writing about them, including myself, at some point in the ancient past, a race of people seemed to have landed on this planet and began to develop this planet as a breakaway civilization and at some point engaged mankind. See, they didn't create us. We were already here. They talk about the fact in the epic of, uh, in the uh, Enuma Elish and the Atrasis epic, they talk about, in two separate writings, by the way, that we, there was a being here and they wanted to get us to do the work for them. So they did something where they call adding their essence to us, which is some type of a genetic modification of sorts. Maybe our junk DNA is what they unplugged. But whatever it was, we ended up going to work for these people and, and uh, they found the first gold mine in exactly where it says on the tablets at Adam's calendar in South Africa. And it's been dated now to 200,000 years old, right when the tablet said the first gold mine happened and people started working uh, under the, you know, the tutelage of these people. So it's pretty interesting stuff. And so these tablets, they pretty much encompass a lot of religious books, uh, Quran, the Bible, uh, a lot of Buddhist beliefs, um, you know, pretty much almost every religion that exists, a lot of them, a lot of the roots come from these ancient tablets. Even the whole creation of our solar system is in the Enumi Elish and the Seven Tablets of Creation, which matches perfectly to astrophysics books at universities. Hmm. Think about that. We're talking about text that goes back tens of thousands of years. How can they be accurate down to science? Talking about orbits, gravitational pulls, uh, 
planets being captured by gravitational fields in the in the in the um, in the beginning stages of the creation of the solar system uh, because of the gravity being captured and t uh, you know uh, thrown towards our sun and, and colliding with other planets creating debris. I mean, the whole thing is right there, and you can almost watch a National Geographic uh, Discovery uh, you know series on it, and you'll they'll tell you the same exact thing. Hmm. It's all based on real science. They talk about orbits changing and shifting, how Neptune and, and Saturn shifted orbits, which is, a, it's, they teach you that in natural physics at college. How did they know this? So all this knowledge is in these ancient tablets. And so I go to them because they're as close to the truth as we're possibly going to get. Like, if you want to get as close to the truth, you're not going to get to the truth truth because still somebody wrote them. But man, there's so much information in there that matches up with real science, which is what I wrote in my book. It's like, it's crazy how accurate it is, and just why I go to the tablets first, because everything else to me is newer, and that's as ancient as you can get. I mean, the Emerald Tablets are 36,000 years old, and that's like one of the oldest accounts of the Great Flood in history. It, it opens up talking about the flood and how the temples were coming up out of the mud, and people were coming out of the caves, and that the hairy barbarians were there. In, the, 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 in other words, they were at a high level of civilization prior to this flood. And so many generations had gone by, they had turned back into just basically, you know, hunter-gatherers almost again. And Thoth talks about his father sending him there, and he gets in a ship and flies up into the sky until the earth disappears. And when he gets to the place appointed, he descends down on the land of Chem. That's Egypt before it was called Egypt. And he tells the people there that he's going to help them rebuild civilization. Rebuild, which means it already was a high-level golden age, probably before this great flood. So these texts, man, they're just incredible. They have so much information in them. It's well worth taking a look at. Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> Let's talk about ancient Egypt. Mm -hmm. I've been looking into a lot of, I mean, talking to Dr. Greer, we talk a lot about zero-point energy. Yeah. I've been looking into zero-point energy, free mm -hmm. energy. I've been researching it, Yeah. looking into the Nikola Tesla stuff, and it sounds like Nikola Tesla got his information somehow from yeah. ancient Egypt. Mm -hmm. A lot yes. of people say that the pyramids were some type of a some type of a power plant. Yes. Not all the pyramids, some of them. So some pyramids have different functions, right? So the Great Pyramid at Giza, for sure, a wireless power plant, amongst other things. It was it was a multifunctional stone computer and a wireless power plant. It was also a communications device. So if you look at old images or old pictures uh, of the Great Pyramid area at Giza, you'll see that the Nile used to run right up alongside of those pyramids. Now it's meandered miles and miles away. One of the main reasons why they don't want you to know is there was an ancient war that happened, that war, that second war I told you about. Mm -hmm. That's why there's glass in the sands at the Giza Plateau. When you dig your hand in the sand, you'll pull up balls of glass. That's 3,000 degrees to create glass out of sand. That's weapons fire. There's still evidence of weapons fire on the Bent Pyramid right out there at Giza as well, which I've documented many times. It's coming out my new TV show. But nonetheless, the water would run underneath in these gigantic aquifers. The tubes for those aquifers are still there. You know, sometimes I've gone down in them. Even kids play around in them and everything. But when you have running water underneath magnetized crystal granite, which is what the base is made out of, you create something called physiostatic electricity. Then those ions rush up into the uh, Grand Gallery area, and there were these resonating rods going up the Grand Gallery to the, to the King's Chamber. Now, the, the rods are gone, but the slots where the rods sat are still there. They can't take out the slots. The slots are embedded in the, in the stone. Then also, when it got into the King's Chamber, it's surrounded by t thousands of tons of magnetized crystal granite in this specialized box with a two-to-one ratio. Now, at some point, something happened where they had to install this extra box. It's a granite box that's inside the king's chamber. People were saying, oh, this is a sarcophagus. I can't even lay in that thing. My, my knees have to be bent. It's not a sarcophagus. What it is, it's the same exact dimensions as the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was a power, a power plant device. We know this based on the descriptions in the Bible. And it's been replicated at two different universities by two different groups of people. And it generated so much power, they had to shut it down just based on the biblical information and instructions. When you take those measurements, it fits directly inside that box. And why did it fit in the box? Because the pyramid at some point had lost its ability to generate the maximum amount of power. And so that was needed to add an extra piece to fix the problem. And that's exactly what they did. Then the energy would shoot up through the apex, 
The obelisks are all made of crystal granite. What Even do you mean, it, the, the obelisk? What is know, that? Those giant stones that stand up with the points at the top? Okay. Those are obelisks. Okay. They're all around the region. We have one at the White House, right? You know, we have one in Rome at the, in the center, courtyard there. They took them and put them all around. The one in, in, in Washington is obviously, it's man-made, but the other ones all around the world are all come from, out of Egypt. But what's interesting is those obelisks, they capture the ambient electricity from the atmosphere, and then if you have something called a jed, it looks like a Tesla coil. I'll send you some photos of this stuff so you can utilize it. It looks like a Tesla coil, and it's all over Egypt. Everywhere you look in hieroglyphs, it's everywhere, and they have cables coming out of them, electric cables. They were connected to their electroplating devices, and anything else they needed, uh, light bulbs, anything that needed electricity was connected to the jed. The jed would capture the ambient electricity from the obelisk. The obelisk were like um, wire, well, you know, electric wire poles in your neighborhood, basically but just doing it all wirelessly. And by that method, they were able to transmit the wireless energy all around the region. And the Jeds would capture that energy and they can power whatever they wanted. And so, you know, now what's also interesting about the Great Pyramid, a small amount of that water would be pushed up into the pyramid and down into the Queen's Chamber. Now the Queen's Chamber, when you analyze it and look at it and look at the x-rays of it, you discover something interesting. It operates like an electrolysis machine. Why electrolysis? If you use electrolysis with running water, you can extract the hydrogen atoms out of the water, hmm. which is what we do in uh, different types of engines that we have right now. The Navy has a, a ship that never has to come back for gas because it just takes the water from the ocean, extracts the uh, hydrogen atoms, and pushes it into a chamber for engine combustion, and they run on hydrogen. They don't run on gas anymore. Matter of fact, that's the wave of the new future. We have Rolls-Royce developed an airplane engine that runs on hydrogen, and all the cars, including all the EVs, are going to go in the garbage can. All cars are going to be hydrogen-based in the next 10 years. Watch, mark my word. Remember today. So what they were doing, though, they were utilizing for what astrophysicists use it for, communication. Astrophysicists communicate and send information out into space to connect with ET or talk to ET on the hydrogen frequency, the most abundant, most abundant frequency in the universe. Now, when you look at the Great Pyramid, it's got these giant shafts on the sides that align with Orion, Aldebaran, Arcturus, and all these other star systems on specific time frames, Sirius. And so what's happening is on specific alignments, they were transmitting on the hydrogen frequency updates, in my opinion, this is now my own hypothesis, updates to those star systems, because why have those shafts pointing at star systems, and why have the, why have them have the capability of shooting hydrogen through those shafts? To me, it's a communications device, the same way we're using right now today in modern astrophysics. Hmm. What are we using in modern astrophysics? We take the hydrogen frequency and we piggyback our data zeros and ones on it, and we send it out into space. Looking and hoping that another race of beings, I think that they already know who they're sending it to. They're just saying, we're hoping. I think they're communicating, but that's a whole other podcast. But sending it out into space that another, another race of people can pick it up and then decode the, uh, the zeros and ones and, and, and you know, decode the message, basically, and then transmit the information back on the same frequency. What makes you think that they've already made communications? Well, to me, just based on the advancement in sciences and what looks and appears to be of NASA as a front, the fake space agency, in other words, doing all the things that are that are already done in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, and still utilizing that same those same techniques today, knowing that we're we know that they're 300 years ahead of us technologically. They meaning the private corporations. Well, why aren't we seeing any of that tech being used? So, I just believe that you know, and I know this 300 years ahead from my private meetings. So, I have a tech company called First Class Space Agency, and I was privy to a TS clearance for private space meetings at the Space Symposium in Colorado a few years ago. And in this room, I'm sitting there with some of the top tech companies in the world in space, uh, you know, travel and also ancillary uh, parts for space, like you know, radiation hardened computer circuits and everything else. And they're all talking about how advanced you know they are. And the number is 300 years ahead of the, po the general population. So if they're 300 years of the general population, 300 years ahead, then what in the world are we doing with chemical rockets going up into space and all this kind of crazy stuff? Mm -hmm. So to me, when they say that they're communicating, 
I say, let me extrapolate a little bit more. They're, I mean, they're trying to communicate. Let me extrapolate. You, you are communicating. This just my, the, way I, the way I decode it is there's something going on. They've probably made some kind of a type of contact at some point because they keep transmitting nonstop, up and down, up and down, nonstop. There's even a dish on the moon that we transmit via laser information to every single week. Who, who, who are we talking to on the moon? Hmm. This has been going on for decades. Why are we doing this? So you got to pay those people to do that. So it's costing money. So there's a reason for this. So my hypothesis is that they may be communicating with somebody already. But I do believe that's what the Great Pyramid was used for, power generation. And when I say uh, other things, you can calculate based on the base size of the pyramid and the height and the size of most of the stones average. You can actually calculate a lot of things. You can calculate the distance of the Earth to the moon, the distance of the Earth to the sun. You can calculate the speed of the Earth on its own axis. How can you, you hold on? How can you calculate all this? Well, when you take, I have all these calculations broken down, which have been analyzed by profes, college professors, and they're blown away. I'll send you a, a sheet so you can show on the screen for this the breakdown of the mathematics, how to you know how to times and square all these numbers uh, to come up with these calculations. You can calculate the, the tropical year, the sidereal year. You can calculate the speed of the Earth around the sun, the speed of the sun around the Milky Way. You can even calculate the speed of the Milky Way around the local cluster of galaxies that are out there. All this can be calculated by the construction. This is the brick masonry. This is the free masonry encoded into the, into the Great Pyramid. This is the mason information. It's all about astrophysics. It's all in there. It's all built into the pyramid, all in the construction process. Now think about that knowledge you have to have. You have to say, I want to have this, 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 and this, and this, and this, and I want to have it all built into the construction. Let me input this into my whatever kind of computer program they utilize to do this, and then it spits out this blueprint, and they build it according to that blueprint so that all this information is encoded in it at the same time it's being built. Wow. Yeah. Wow. With, when it comes to, you had mentioned a little bit earlier that you think that all vehicles are going to go to hydro, yeah. hydrocarbon. Oh, yeah. Hydrogen. Right? Hydrogen. Hydrogen. Excuse yeah. me. The hydrogen, hydrogen. atoms. Yes. Somebody already developed this. Yeah. And they're Stan no Meyer. longer here. Is Stan that his Meyer. name? Stan Meyer in the night. I remember watching that commercial live on TV as it aired on the news station, standing right next to my mom. That he was drove this little buggy he built, runs a run on water. You can go from New York to California on one gallon of gas. He said, You can piss in it, you can spit in it, you can put snow in it. <laughs> this guy was going in. And I was so amazed. I was like, This is crazy. This is incredible. Of course, he went to. Uh, a restaurant where he met with some Pentagon officials and then uh, he ran outside and screamed, they poisoned me and he died right there, right in front of his brother. And so at the time they wanted to do away with it. We got to a point now where the world is fed up and tired of these pipelines and, and invading countries to take over their resources and trying to build pipelines through the middle of countries that don't want the pipeline. It's, it's a big thing, it's a big, big problem right now and it's driving economies up and down and it's causing billionaires to become millionaires. And when it starts affecting their pockets, something's gotta change. So now we have this big push, right? This EV thing came. EV still use what? They use gas. They still use fuel. Why? Because when you plug that, that car in, down the street, the power station is using oil to yeah. give you that electricity. And then the infrastructure will never be good enough to, to, um, to house you know, billions or millions of cars in the US economy. It just won't happen. Um, just one hurricane in Florida, you'll see it'll be a nightmare because you won't be able to evacuate because when you get to about 100 miles away from your house, you got to turn around and go back home and you can't get in a line to charge your car. The lines will be longer than gas lines. Yeah. So it's a nightmare waiting to happen. The push now is going to be all hydrogen. Everything will become hydrogen. All cars, EVs will die. The, the batteries are not recyclable. The cobalt and the lithium are made with forced child labor. Right in third world countries, kids literally mining with their bare hands, pulling this ore out of the ground, getting caught in collapses and mine collapses and dying and everything else. All that's got to come to an end. All we need is for one rogue nation to take over one of these biggest lithium and cobalt mines and hold the world hostage for the cobalt and the lithium and everything comes to an end, right? The prices will super skyrocket. There'll be a shortage of, of, of batteries and cars and you can't recycle them because Elon Musk made it open source battery. So everyone who's, who created a battery created them slightly different. There's no one mechanism or method to, to take these batteries apart and recycle them. So they're, they're filling up in landfills by the thousands. And, and even in China, there's already millions of landfills and they're more toxic for the environment than a, 
a regular old fashioned engine, uh, you know, crankshaft. Yeah. So it's pretty dangerous stuff, and it's leaching into the the water supply. We're drinking this this poison and everything else. It's going to shorten our lifespans. They got to get away from that. They're going to go into hydrogen next. Interesting. What do you think about? <clears throat> you talked about those boxes of uh, that that produce energy. Yeah. Why do you think this hasn't been replicated? Well, you know, they have been replicated, but they've been um, they've been uh, what do you call it? Uh, eminent domained by by the government. A lot of people who create these incredible inventions, they don't go about it the right way. They think they're going to be able to patent these items, to patent these inventions, and then put them out and become a billionaire. That's their dream. Well, they're crazy. It's not going to happen. You have to do what Elon Musk did, Musk did with the battery, right, with the Tesla battery. You have to make it open source and create an industry and just take your fair share of what comes your way. Don't try to become the king of this technology you know, so you can, you know, 20 generations could be trillionaires. That's the wrong mindset. The right mindset is don't patent it, make it open source, release it to the world, let everybody develop it. Then who are they going to come kill? Everybody? <laughs> yeah. You see, my tech company, we're doing the same thing. We're doing everything open source. We start, our laboratory ended up closing down because of the whole global sickness thing that came. We, we were just getting ready to start it, fire it up. We had a, an astrophysicist, we had a, um, a quantum physicist and an engineer. But now we're going to restart again in 2024 and redo the lab and, and get everything cranking up again. But every, every concept, every idea, every theory, every, uh, everything we create is all going to be open source. We're not looking to become trillionaires off of on a great idea. We're looking to free the world from its bonds. Mm -hmm. And when you go with that mindset, your abundance is going to be guaranteed because you're operating in the right frequency. You're doing things right. And so you, everything will be taken care of. All you have to do is just... Find a way to create these incredible technologies and release them to the world and let everybody have the schematics. And you'll find out that you'll still be able to eat. I guarantee you there's enough abundance for everyone to eat. But people think there's scarcity. There is no scarcity on this planet. It doesn't exist. This universe is abundant in every way you could think of. I mean, with free energy, I mean, it doesn't kind of make the whatever currency you're using almost, I wouldn't say 100% irrelevant, mm -hmm. but... Yeah, Pretty it's gonna close. it's gonna help lead us and guide us into a brand new economy, which has to come at some point. We know that no empire can persist forever. I mean, just just read a history book, you'll see that. I mean, the Romans they they're gone too, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's this cycle where, no matter how big you get, there's always always a, this recycling, this cyclical civilization rise and fall of governments and everything. It, it just happens. It's just part of life. And this economy that we're under right now, it, it will not persist forever. At some point, it will evolve at these technologies are developed and people are able to get access to free energy and clean water and evil, evil even the playing field a little bit, um, you know, I think that the economy will shift, global economies will completely shift out of what we have right now, where we have a small amount of people, we have less than 100 families controlling 8 billion people. Think about that. 8 billion people being controlled by less than 100 families. This is why the aliens don't talk to us directly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, think about it. If I'm a super advanced race, I'm a class, you know, a type three civilization or type two civilization, and I fly by and I look at the earth and I see, oh, they got uh, 29,000 nuclear bombs aimed at themselves while they're still on the planet. And 8 billion people are being controlled by this many tiny people, and they can't see how to take back control of their own planet and love one another. Why would I even stop by? So, we have to at some point realize this is not the way. Our economy's got to shift. It's got to change. It's probably going to go to a, a credit-based system, not credit like, like your credit score, but credits of some type, whether it's through crypto or blockchain technology, some way you have access to uh, uh, you know, digital wallets, but that you're really your status in society will be how good you are at what you do and how much you help people and also will eventually harness the power of AI and robotics to free the burden of humanity instead of putting us to become eventually their slaves or maybe even worse. <laughs> I think when we have the right idea and concept of how to utilize these technologies, that people will be free to travel, explore. If you want to work somewhere, you can work somewhere. There'll be programs set up where if something takes your job, like an AI or a robot, you'll be then, your bills have got to be reduced. Your, your, your you know, personal responsibilities have got to be wiped out in some way, shape, or form. All this is rough ideas, but something has to be thought through that, will lead us into an economy and a world where people and human beings can thrive. Because after all, the most important thing is for human beings to thrive, not for a small amount of corporations to thrive. Mm -hmm. 
to 100% agree with you there. Let's get back to ancient Egypt. Yeah. <clears throat> Some of the things that really caught my attention was it's, and we're not just talking ancient Egypt. I had, I had read or saw or heard that from multiple sources that a lot of these what do you, wonders of the world, mm -hmm. Easter Island, Machu Picchu, yeah. the pyramids, uh, Stonehenge, mm -hmm. there's probably more. Oh, yeah. But I've read that they're all, all these unexplainable ancient structures mm -hmm. are all sitting right on top of fault lines. Is there any truth to that? They're not on fault lines. They're actually on energy grids. And the majority what is an of them, energy grid? an energy grid is where the ma magne magnetic field of the Earth whips out of the planet. So a lot of these structures are literally, literally sitting directly on top of these high energy magnetic fields. Really? So if you take an, or if you go and get the uh, from USGS.gov and take the Earth's magnetic field map, and then lay it over a map of like a lot of these megalithic structures, all of a sudden you go, oh my God, they're all sitting on top of like high energy magnetic portals, basically. And what's interesting about that is how in the world did they figure this out? Like what type of tool do you use to measure how much magnetism is whipping out of the earth here from the core or a hundred miles away? How do you distinguish which one is the one, you know, the spot to put it in? They had to have had some level of advanced technology that had the capability. Now we do it through satellite technology. So how in the world were they able to do it? We have a satellite that orbits the planet in a polar orbit. It orbits this way, not this way. And as the Earth spins on its axis, it's taking swaths of data. Magnetism, electric magnetic fields, it's taking topographical data and so forth and so on, uh, minerals and so forth. We know everything that's on Earth from a polar orbiting satellite, which is why I believe that that's exactly what was used. Because if you look at the Great Pyramid at Giza, where is it located? Directly at the center of land mass on Earth, not the center of the Earth, the center of land mass. There's only one way to get that calculation. You have to have a satellite orbiting in a polar orbit, scanning the planet as it spins on its axis to pick up all the topographical data, to, able to, to be able to calculate the land mass and to find the dead center of the mass of land. And not only that, of course, it has one of the biggest magnetic fields coming right out of that spot too. So boom, dead center, they drop it right there. And then also the Great Pyramid, the height of it, matches the average height of all the peaks on Earth. Again, how can you do that? Polar orbiting satellite, as it's, the Earth is spinning, it's calculating the, the all the peak, peaks. The peak of the pyramid yes. is the average of all the peaks on Earth. On Earth. All the natural peaks on Earth is the average height of all the natural peaks on Earth. I mean, there's just so many things. <laughs> there's so many things with the pyramids yeah. and these other structures that just, I it's mean, mind it's boggling. Just, I mean, I was taught that these seven ton bricks yeah. were you know they use sticks sticks and and, and to, ropes and mud and elephants up. you know the mud ramp theory had a little it took over for a little while but then uh some real good physicists said ah, i don't know you would need they did some calculations you would need more mass than the pyramid in mud to be able to create the mud ramps to put the <laughs> it just didn't it didn't add up yeah so the mud ramp uh, you know, and, and then the, the lack of, obviously, lack of trees and lack of timber and so forth to roll these, rolling these, you know, 15-ton <laughs> stones in some cases on top of uh, wooden. I mean, come on. It just, it just sounds crazy. Yeah. Uh, and, and when you go to the Serapium at uh, Saqqara, which is Enki's Halls of Amenti, it's these underground halls that are there that I take people to every year that has this incredible hallway carved out of solid stone underground, and these alcoves are in there, and inside of each alcove, perfectly fitted, snight and tight and snug, are these 60 and 70 ton, what look like sarcophagus. What's a sarcoph sarcophagus? Uh, what they claim they would put the dead body in, you know. Okay. But it's not a, they're not sarcophagus because there's no dead bodies in them. They're clean. They're, they're actually, you can, you can eat off the floor inside of those things. You can, I've stood inside of them. They, they're higher than my head and I'm six foot four. The lids weigh like 40 tons. And, but if you read the Animal Tablets, you discover those were the halls of Amenti where uh, these beings claimed to have rejuvenation chambers. And they would put bodies in them. And they would literally had some type of technology that would transfer their consciousness into a new body 
when the other one wore out. And they would put the wore out body in these things and let them rejuvenate over time. Sounds crazy, but now modern science is doing the same exact thing. They literally are right now doing the same exact thing, learning how to transfer human consciousness from one body to another. They've even created mind links where they can transfer an active awake person's mind into a person that is already awake and conscious. Wait a minute. What, who's doing this? Scientists this at the happening? Brain Institute and other laboratories all around the world. They have this, an experiment, and I'll get you the exact um, experiment that it was, where they have one gentleman in a room with, his, with a blindfold on and his hand on a remote control video game in front of him, but he can't see the video game. They have another gentleman in another room who's looking at the video game with no remote control. They create a mind link between the two and transfer this guy's mind into the other guy. He's now controlling the other guy's hands to play the video game. No way. Yes. This, this is documented. Documented. Real actual science. Actual science. Actual science. I'll send you. To, and listen, in Russia, the 2045 project, Ray Kurzweil, they've already took a monkey and transferred its consciousness into a computer. That was done in 2010. In 2000, I think, 16 or 17, it was to transfer a human consciousness into a robot, which that's been done. In America, we have DARPA. They, are, they have the Avatar Project. Look that up, the Avatar Project. I wrote about it in my book, where they transfer a soldier's consciousness into a field robot, and then the only thing that gets damaged if the robot blows up, the, the, the symbiotic link is disconnected through consciousness, but the, the soldier's obviously not going to die. And so this has all been done. This is real science being actively used right now. By 2045, which is the 2045 project in Russia, they're looking to transfer a human consciousness into an actual being, an actual avatar body. You know, so they can take a skin cell from you. They can put it in a Petri dish. They can get it under the right conditions, turn that skin cell into a stem cell, culture that, turn that into a group of stem cells, and then grow that into a full clone of yourself using your own stem cells, and then transfer your mind into your new body. Whoa. I've never heard this before. Yeah. Ever. And it's all in my book. It's all, this is real stuff, man. This <laughs> How do you find this kind of stuff? It just comes to me, you know. Uh, when you start, you know, when you start going down these these paths of research, you become a magnet for information, and information just begins to come directly to you from all sources. And uh, and then when you look it up and dig deeper into it, obviously some of it's not good. You don't use it, but the stuff that is real, I I, I write about it and I put my source links to it because I want people to know like this is real, and you can go look it up yourself. Wow, wow, what. <clears throat> Let's let's go back to the pyramids mm -hmm. and in all these other wonders of the world. Yeah, I mean, a lot of these wonders are <clears throat> the architecture mm -hmm. and the the strategy to build the actual the buildings yeah. seem to be identical mm -hmm. in a lot of these places. Oh yeah, <laughs> how do you explain that? One master architect. If you look at the Emerald Tablets, got to go back to the oldest text that we know of, 36,000, 38,000-year-old text. Both claims to have built the Great Pyramid. He said, build it I, the Great Pyramid, pattern after Earth's force, so that it too might remain through the ages. And it, it, and it sure has. So the Great Pyramid is not four or 5,000 years old. That Great Pyramid is about 36, 38,000 years old. And so is the Sphinx. His father told him to build the Sphinx and put his face on it. And then later on, that face was recarved. This is why the face is not the right size for the body to his nephew's face. But the face was never the face of a lion. But this guy was the master architect. He laid down the blueprint for how to do this. In the Emerald Tablets, he takes a crew with him on the great ship that descends on the land of Kem, rebuilds the land of Kem. He says something very interesting in this text. After spending many years there, they don't specify exactly how many, but they say many, many years, rebuilding the land of Kem, he tells that crew, that team that came with those original, that original team to spread out around the world and duplicate what we did here. And then all of a sudden, what happens? Pyramids pop up all around the world, megalithic structures, megalithic temples all around the world, all using the same exact building technique. Thoth himself even leaves Africa, takes Olmecs with him, and leaves his brother Amun Ra in charge, and he goes to Mesoamerica, and builds a Teotihuacan civilization and builds that whole Teotihuacan pyramid complex, which, by the way, is aligned with Orion, the same exact formation as the ones in Africa, at Egypt, right, at Giza. And also what? Built on top of an aquifer. The base of the Pyramid of the Sun is exactly the same size as the base of the pyramid, Great Pyramid at Giza. And the height 
is exactly 50% the height down to the millimeter of the Great Pyramid at Giza. Again, down one, to the millimeter? Down to the millimeter. And this is, again, what? One master architect, again, showcasing his talents and going all around the world. This guy is known everywhere I've gone on the planet. I went to Africa. I went to, he's obviously all throughout Africa. He's known as Tahuti, Jehuti, Thoth, right? Uh, according to the ancient Egyptians, he ruled for 16,000 years, one person. In China, he's Wang Di, the first emperor of China who came down on a fiery dragon. Sounds like a flying ship. Ruled over to China for, for decades, uh, no, for several hundreds, yeah, for several centuries, and then just got on this flying dragon and disappeared again. In Mexico, he's known as Quetzalcoatl, Lord Pakal, Kukulkan. He comes in on again a what? According to the Mayans, a fiery dragon. And he's there. What he built? Chichen Itza, Teotihuacan, Cobo, all these places were developed. The Mayans didn't build anything. They inherited what was already there. The Aztecs didn't build anything. It was already there. And that's even in their own records. Matter of fact, they didn't even know who the people were originally that built some of the stuff, so they gave them the name Teotihuacans. But in the Emerald Tablets, it tells you exactly who it was. And so uh, I was out in Australia in the outback, in the middle of nowhere, a gigantic petroglyph of who? Thoth, out of Kemet, in Australia, carved into rock in the ground. They call him Thothamabi in Australia. The Aboriginal people call him Thothamabi, and he's on a ship flying through the Milky Way galaxy. That's what it is, a giant disc, and he's you know, sitting on this thing. And they say that's him flying through the Milky Way galaxy. Wow. And, you know, so the more you look into it, these structures, they were built, they were built by people, not aliens. In other words, Thoth, in my opinion, wasn't from this planet, according, and also his relatives, but they had the people doing the labor. They taught the construction techniques, and they had the blueprints on how to do this. They weren't going to get out there themselves and do all this hard labor, but they had the blueprints. They laid out the foundation, and they said, hey, this is how we do this, and we're going to do this all around the entire planet. I mean, how do you think it was built? I mean, I've had... People that I ver have a lot of respect for and know mm -hmm. for a fact that they are ex extremely intelligent individuals. Yeah. One of them yeah. I've had on the show, his name's Chris Beck, mm -hmm. and he was talking about the exact same thing, the yeah. aquifers, the crystals, yeah. the energy. And, um, I mean, he, he, he was like, well, how do you move, you know, yeah. how do you, how do do you move it? things? Yeah. Frequency and vibration. That's it. And if you think about it, if I put a subwoofer under mm -hmm. a glass top table and I put a, a brick on it, mm -hmm. it's going to move. It's going to move. You know, and so do you think, is that how it did? Did they create some type of frequency and vibration? Which yeah. There's a famous Sumerian cylinder scroll. I'm going to send you a copy of this image. You see an Anunnaki god, you call him a god with a low case G, it ain't, it ain't the god god, okay? We know god is a god for real, but that ain't the god. They call him a god because these people didn't understand. These people had advanced technology. He's sitting on this box. This box has a symbol for magnetism on it, okay? And this ancient Sumerian tablet. And then, so he's sitting here with this, with this box. There's this tripod thing up in the air and it's got this disc. Underneath the disc is a gigantic stone table and there's human beings, you can tell they're human because their height compared to this guy, they're tiny. And a human is picking it up with one hand. That disc is a cymatic frequency. You can perfectly match. I found the exact frequency, and I have a video on that frequency, which creates that exact same cymatic pattern. And so that cymatic pattern and magnetism in some way reduced the weight of that gigantic stone table, allowing an average normal human being to pick it up with one hand. I'm going to send you this image. Pretty interesting stuff. So when you now say, well, how did they do all this? Cymatic frequencies and magnetism, electromagnetism and somatic frequencies, in some way together, they combine those two things to reduce the weight. They didn't make them completely weightless, but they significantly reduced the weight of a lot of the stones. The second thing is, Thoth gives away something else in the Emerald Tablets. He utilizes cymatic frequencies and photons to manifest solid matter. Now that sounds crazy in ancient tablets, but guess what happened two years ago in a laboratory in the in the world we live in right now, scientists got together and they combined cymatic frequencies and photons and for the first time ever created solid matter. That's in physics.org. Wow. So where, where did that happen? That happened, I believe it was in the UK. Okay. Yeah. And I'll give you the link to, to all this stuff. So pretty interesting, right? So the tablets <laughs> keep getting so. proven. 
by modern science. This is why I keep going back to the tablets because wait a minute, this guy says this then, you know, you've heard of the active denial system in the military. It's this dish that sends out a beam of frequency towards people that are looking to be, you know, do harm, right? Mobs, and it make you, it'll make you stop in your tracks. It'll make you feel like you got a vomit. It'll make you feel like you're on fire. It, it can even put voices in your head. It's called the active denial system in the military. Well, in the Emerald Tabas, Thos has this group of people coming at him because they don't know who he is when he lands his ship. He says, I raised my staff and sent out a ray of vibration which stopped them still in their tracks. Sounds like the active denial system to me. Same technology, just dip, you know, just a different year. So I go over all, I keep putting these, com these, these, um, these things in my book to show the commonalities between the two because what we're doing now, we're just simply rediscovering everything that already existed. <laughs> Yeah. We haven't done anything new yet. Everything was already done. Everything has already been done. We're just rediscovering what we lost. Could you describe, I was watching this documentary last night, trying to get spun up on all this stuff again. <laughs> and um, they talked a lot about how the pyramids, how a lot of these structures are measured in the mm -hmm. metric system. Yeah. However, the and they're perfect. I, yeah. I don't know the exact me measurements, mm -hmm. but yeah. the the stones are in the perfect metric system. Yes. Let's say it's three meters by three meters. Mm -hmm. The doorways, perfect metric yeah. system, maybe three meters by two meters. Mm -hmm. You know, the base of the pyramid. Yeah. The the it's all based on meters. The whole thing. The metric system wasn't developed for another two thousand years. Listen, even the Grand Gallery, the location of the Grand Gallery inside the Great Pyramid. When you look at the, um, the, the longitude, it's the same exact digits as the speed of light in meters per second. How is this possible? Well, I started asking the same question. And I said, wait, I got to find some kind of link to this. And I found it. Guess what they found in Mexico decades ago? They found proto-Sumerian cuneiform tablets and pottery and everything else. What is proto, meaning pre-Sumerian, stuff doing in the Americas. But not only did they find that, this is even on Wikipedia. It was a metric system. It was their metric system. So the metric system is thousands and tens of thousands of years old. Forget thousands, tens of thousands of years old. We only rediscovered what already existed or probably the guy, I forget his name now, the French man who came up with it, probably found these tablets or, or, or the existence of these tablets and said, oh, I can make this whole metric system out of this. It already existed. The metric system is ancient. We only rediscovered what it was recently. That's, all, that's the only thing I can give you. How about the golden ratio? Yeah. What is the golden ratio? Uh, the golden ratio is a specific numeric equation that gives you 3.17. It gives you the Fibonacci spiral. It also gives you the, uh, the golden rectangle and the, and the golden uh, triangle, which no matter which way you look at them, you can always get the perfect spiral to fit inside. And that spiral, for whatever reason, because that spiral is in everything that's in life, it's very beautiful to us. So the most magnificent structures were always set on the Fibonacci uh, uh, spiral or pi, right? And so even the Great Pyramid is built on pi. All these magnificent, magnificent structures were built on pi because for some reason it taps into our inner consciousness, our inner being. Our fingers, if you take your fingers and look at the space between your digits, you'll get pi, and you can get the Fibonacci code based on the, the space in the digits of your own hand. The distance from your eyes to your nose, the distance from your top of your, uh, in between your eyebrows to the tip of your nose, all this is all the same thing over, and it just can be, the, the distance from your elbow to your wrist, the distance from the wrist to the tip of your middle finger, it's all pi. You see? Are you, are you kidding me? What um, do you the, mean it's The pie? whole human body's designed on that number. You mean it's the... What you, do you, you mean get, it's, it's pi? You can get, the, if you look at, if you calculate the distance in the space in between your digits and your elbows and your joints and everything else, I'll send you a diagram on this as well. You'll get the Fibonacci sequence built into the human avatar body itself. It's in everything. I mean, what, I don't understand how it could be pi, because yeah. if it's pi is what, 3.14? Repeating three, yes. forever? Right, but it's you insanity. see when you when you calculate well, pi creates the Fibonacci spiral or allows you to place the Fibonacci spiral inside of anything, right? And so when you start creating these calculations and you start doing the measurements of these distances, you start finding out that they fit perfectly with that number. 
and that you can get the Fibonacci sequence is built into the human avatar body. And I'll give you a complete diagram so you can see how it all breaks down. Okay. I'm still, I just want to figure it out right now because my mind's blown. <laughs> so, I mean, obviously the distance from my eye to the middle of my, whatever this is, nose, yeah, right. Top you know, nose yeah. is completely different than from my elbow to my wrist. Right. But there's a ratio. And when you apply this specific ratio, you'll find that this is the reason why this is, um, this, this distance is the average distance. And this distance to here is the average distance. In other words, they can calculate based on how many inches or millimeters or centimeters, it comes out to be a perfect, when they make the boxes and connect everything, it comes out to be like the golden rectangle, the golden triangle. And you can fit the Fibonacci sequence right inside or the, or the Fibonacci spiral right inside of them. When they begin to make all the connections, like connecting dots, all of a sudden everything fits perfectly. And I'll, I, like I said, so in other words, if I, if I take the distance from this digit to this digit and this digit to this digit and this digit to the top of my finger, all of a sudden I'll find that when I look at it underneath the connected rectangles, that Fibonacci will fit inside of these digits. So the Fibonacci sequence, which is now we find in almost all life, is actually part of fractals. So we're living in a fractal-based universe. Everything is a fractal of, of something else, something bigger, something grander. But also, it's also a fingerprint. So the fingerprint of God is the Fibonacci sequence. It's the evidence that we're living in a creation that we also are created. Interesting. Let's take a quick break and then yeah. we'll dive back in. All right. I've spent more time than I would like to admit researching testing, trying to find the perfect mattress that's going to give me a good night's sleep. And it basically got to the point where I just gave up. I suffer from chronic back pain. It comes from 14 years of combat operations as a Navy SEAL and a CIA contractor. My back's just shot. No matter what mattress I use, it, I wake up, I can't move. It takes me about 45 minutes just to loosen up, to bend over, to put my shoes on, to get out the door. And then... Somebody, a friend of mine, told me about Helix mattresses. So I went to the website. Turns out they got a quiz you take. You take the quiz, and then they make a recommendation out of the 20 mattresses they have in stock. Mine was the Midnight Lux, and bam, had it shipped right to my house. Very skeptical, by the way, but slept on it first night. Slept like a baby. Complete game changer. Another thing I like about Helix mattresses is they have the enhanced cooling feature that keeps you from overheating. We've all used mattresses where you wake up, especially these memory foam ones, right? You wake up and you're sweating. And you can't go back to sleep. Well, Helix is taking care of that. Take the Helix Sleep Quiz at helixsleep.com and find your perfect mattress in under two minutes. Helix is offering 20% off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners. Go to helixsleep.com slash SRS and use the code HELIXPARTNER20. This is their best offer yet, and it's not gonna last long. With Helix, better sleep starts now. Here's the situation. You've got China, Russia, Ukraine, the border. The banks seem to be collapsing. Plus, the Chinese just negotiated with Iran, Saudi Arabia, and Brazil to drop the U.S. dollar. And most Americans, including myself, feel that we're in a recession right now. But despite all the evidence, I can't tell you what's going to happen for sure. Nobody can. Yet when it comes to your money, you should understand what's at stake. That's why I partnered with Gold Co. to possibly help at times like this. Go to seanlikesgold.com or call 855-936-GOLD to get your free gold and silver kit. The kit shows you how to defend your money with precious metals and how listeners of the show could get up to $10,000 in bonus silver. Go to seanlikesgold.com or call 855-936-GOLD to get your free gold and silver kit. I can't predict the future, but I can certainly prepare for it. So go to seanlikesgold.com or call 855-936-GOLD now. Performance may vary. Consult with your tax attorney or financial professional before making an investment decision. All right, Billy, we're back from the break. Yeah. 
this discussion is blowing my mind here. <laughs> but um, I wanted to talk to you about CERN, yeah. too. So mm -hmm. is there any, is CERN learning anything from ancient Egypt? Yeah. CERN being, can you describe what CERN is? Sure. CERN is the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider. It's the largest machine in the world located in Switzerland. And it's all underground. And it uses this gigantic track, this underground tube that's connected. And they send atoms in opposite directions and speed them up to, you know, a percentage of the speed of light and then let them collide. And then they analyze the collision to see what comes out of this collision between atoms, you know, quarks and muons and everything else that they discover. But something else they discover in this, in the process is that they create microscopic black holes. Now, really? Yeah. So originally a lot of people were getting scared about this because they were like, man, if you guys create a black hole here on Earth, will it suck the Earth in? I mean, kind of fair to assume like black holes are supposed to be pretty deadly things. Even light can't escape them. Mm -hmm. So why create one here on Earth? But I think in my opinion, again, this is nothing that I've read, but my hypothesis is that part of the work going on at CERN is to learn how to create stable wormholes. What Einstein and Rosen called an Einstein-Rosen bridge where you take space and you fold it and make a hole, punch a hole in between to make a connection, a shortcut through space time. And so it could be you know, learning or trying to experiment either by accident or on purpose, how to create a stable wormhole. How do you create one and hold it open? The hold biggest on. thing is holding it open. Hold on. Can you sit, can you, let's back, yeah. I'm slow. <laughs> so, I don't have a degree in astrophysics and I don't have anything from MIT or Harvard. Yeah. So you're, you're talking about you're folding folding space yeah. and creating a hole through it. So right. I'm envisioning. Yeah. You take a piece of paper. Dr. Greer kind of showed me this, yeah, I you think. You just bend it like this. Bend it like this. And if you had a pencil, you could poke a hole right through. So you can go from point A to point B. Instead of traveling over the length of that sheet of paper to get from point A to point B, you now just arrive at point B almost instantaneously. Okay. You see? And Einstein and another professor, another a theoretical physicist named Rosen, they they call it the Einstein-Rosen bridge was a theoretical name for this um, for this type of hypothesis on how to create a wormhole or what a wormhole would be, well, how it would operate, how it would work. The biggest problem that we have is not creating the wormhole now because we can create them, but how do, we keep, how do you keep it open? How do you make it stable for something to pass through without collapsing? Now, NASA recently discovered something called X points around Earth and also around the sun. These are naturally occurring portals, portals that open and close every single day all around the outside of our planet. The FEMA satellite system discovered these portals a few years back, and I've been analyzing and watching them. Some of them create direct pathways to the sun and even to other planets in our solar system. So these are called X points. They exist all around the outside of our planet. They're where magnetic diffusion points hit and cross, like our magnetic fields hit and cross. In some way, combining that crossing of electromagnetic fields with charged particles from the sun opens up a portal. So portals naturally can occur in nature. You don't have to make them artificially. So that's pretty interesting. All we have to do now is learn how to harness that power and we can travel through space we can go great distances without having to put ourselves in hibernation pods and things like that. Mm -hmm. But now what's interesting is you look at some of the pyramid structures and also read the ancient text. If you go to one of the Sumerian tablets, they talk about having something called a Duran key. It was called a bond heaven earth. And Enlil talks about walking from his home world directly to earth and walking from earth directly back to his home world, bypassing even getting in a spaceship. You go fast forward a little bit more, the ancient Egyptians talk about something called a Jed Pillar Ankh. They have a Jed connected to the inside of Ankh. People think the Ankh was like for decoration or represented rebirth and, 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 and the womb of a woman and all that. It kind of did. Now we just, nowadays, it's just decoration like jewelry. <laughs> but it also represented something more technological in the ancient times. When you go to the super ancient texts, you discover that that Ankh and that Jed were a oscillator that would resonate to the atomic frequency of the owner. That was the code programmed into the actual Ankh. The actual portal that they would walk through to travel wherever they were going, it would only let you walk through it if your frequency was programmed into the portal. That was your key. Without walking through with that, you would be obliterated. 
That's how they kept people from just getting into these portals. Only the elite of the elite had access to these portals to, to travel all around the world. There's one in Mexico, in Tula, Mexico, where Thoth the Atlantean, who came from Africa over there, he would stand there, and this looks like an indention in the wall, and he would literally walk through it, and he would reappear somewhere else in the world, and he would come back from time to time and so forth. But again, he would have the Jed Pillar Ankh in his hand. Then you look at Bosnia in Europe. There's a pyramid there called the Pyramid of the Sun, just like the one, there's, there's one in Mexico called the Pyramid of the Sun. There's one in Bosnia called the Pyramid of the Sun. It's massive. In this valley, there's like five massive pyramids, all covered with brush and trees and debris. Well, they started digging this thing out. They said, oh my God, these are solid stone blocks. There's tunnels underneath that are connecting the pyramids. The same exact tunnels that are in Teotihuacan in Mexico connecting the pyramid structures there. But inside of this one tunnel, they found this gigantic crystal. It's called the K2 megalith. And on it is written in runes, an ancient writing. It says, we must sta stand in defense until we can open the gate. Well, what gate are they talking about? I believe they're talking about the Stargate to get from wherever they were to get out of this war. There was a war going on. Again, that second pyramid war I told you about, it was a global war. It wasn't only global, it was interplanetary as well because it went to the moon and also to Mars, but that's probably gonna be another podcast. But the evidence of it is available in scientific data. But this, this K2 megalith, this gigantic crystal, it has something to do with activating the portal at this Pyramid of the Sun in Bosnia, which at some point they were defending it and trying to thwart some people from getting access to it until they can get it activated so they can walk through themselves. Pretty interesting stuff. And this is well documented, the K2 megalith gigantic crystal. So CERN, in my opinion, is researching and learning about technologies that already existed. Again, we're just rediscovering everything. When you go to CERN, Right outside the front door is this gigantic uh, picture of uh, this Indian god that is standing inside of a portal, walking through. Hmm. So I think they kind of knew what they were going to be doing when they started this whole building and started this whole uh, project, um, but they just kind of kept it low key to the general public, and they only released tidbits of information as to what's going on. There was something interesting before we go on. There was a a field trip of sorts where they let the tour to let people come in and look around. And as one person was looking around, they saw these gigantic clear panels. They don't know what material they were made out of. And I have a picture of them leaning up against the side of a part of the machine with these hieroglyphs on them. So they sent these hieroglyphs out, everyone, including I've sent the hieroglyphs out. Nobody can decipher these hieroglyphs. Nobody knows what in the world these are, what they mean, where they came from, who wrote them, what writing, what ancient culture are they linked to? Nobody knows. Massive, giant, clear plates leaning up against the machine. Um, I think it were four of them, if I remember correctly. Pretty interesting. I thought that, I just thought that was a weird thing that you know to happen there. But to have at the front door, gigantic portal, a representation of a portal with one of these ancient Indian gods walking through it. What do you? I mean, what do you think they're doing with these mini black holes that you think that they're creating? Yeah. All experiments. Have they documented this? Yeah, yeah, they, they have. have. They have, yeah. People were trying to stop them from doing it because they were gonna, it was gonna, it was gonna, you know, destroy the planet and everything else. But they just kept working anyway. <laughs> they didn't care. But um, they are just, in my opinion, learning about these creation of portals, learning how to create st stable wormholes. Um, just like all experimenting, just trying to figure out how do we, what type of energy can we inject into a, a one of these holes that will stabilize it, maybe even expand it. And where, where do they lead? Where do they go? Like when we go through them, where will we end up? Maybe they're sending small probes through or things through to take a look. Maybe they're sending nano probes into them. Who what do knows? You th what do you think about this? Are you, are you for this? You against this? What do you think? <laughs> this type of research without complete oversight to me is scary stuff, man. I mean, me too. you don't even know what can come through. Like I do believe in life in other worlds and also life in even other dimensions. We know that based on theoretical physicists like Michio Kaku and many other well-respected physicists that we're living in a universe based on 11 dimensions. They theorize based on the mathematics that without 11 dimensions, this universe would collapse. Okay. What, okay. So can you, <clears throat> I have a tough time wrapping my head around yeah. different dimensions right. as well. <laughs> yeah. I've talked to a couple different people. They broke it down mm -hmm. fairly well for me. Yeah. I would like to hear you break down what... 
What is demen- What is a dimension? Yeah. Well, dimension is um, is a realm that exists at a different frequency. So right now we're in the third dimension. We only can control the first and the second. All right. The first dimension is a line. The second dimension is connected lines. And because we're in the third dimension, we can, we we're like the god over the second and the first. We can control and manipulate those dimensions from the outside. If people were living in those dimensions, like one dimensional people or two dimensional people, they would be at complete awe of what our capabilities were because they, they, first of all, they wouldn't be able to see us as a third dimensional being. All they would see is the manipulation of their environment and they would wonder what's going on. All right, so that's kind of power we would have. Now, extrapolate fourth dimension. The fourth dimension used to be said it was time. It's not time. That's just a hypothesis that Einstein was trying to correlate time to the third. The fourth dimension is a tesseract, a fourth dimensional hypercube. From the fourth dimension and all the way up, things change completely. So we're in the third. Somebody in the fourth dimension, an entity in the fourth dimension, can see into everything. They can see through this ceiling and watch us sitting here right now. All right? They can see the past, present, and future all at the same time. In other words, when I first walked in a building and you greeted me, you know, they would see that. In another room, they would see us taking photos. And in this room, they would see us doing this interview. But they would see all three things happening at the same time. It's like having a house and living different parts of your life at the same time in different years in the same house, right? Hmm. And then above that, you have the fifth, sixth, seventh. Now, these dimensions are compactified. And yes, that's an actual real word, compactified. (laughs) (laughs) They are, look, look it up, guys. Whoever's looking, look up the word. They're stacked so tight on top of each other that they're like a plonk unit of distance away from this universe, right? And now the only way to get into one is to move into a right angle at a different frequency. You have to obtain the subatomic frequency of that dimension. So if there are beings in higher dimensions that have developed the ability to understand and get the actual subatomic frequency number of the third dimension in this universe, they can theoretically walk from their universe or their dimension directly into ours. What, what do you mean the frequency? Okay. Every universe has a specific frequency. Every dimension in that same universe also has a frequency. Every atom resonates at a specific frequency. Nothing ever rests. Everything is always vibrating. At the subatomic level, we know that when you dig deep into the nucleus of an actual atom, What's in there is a tiny vibrating string. So we're living in a symphony of music, and the music that's jingling and making this noise is creating the illusion of physicality, the illusion of solidity, even the illusion of distance, which doesn't even exist. And so that's what we're living in. Now, if, if I can obtain, for example, let's say there's a cancer tumor in a person's body. Mm-hmm. The, the cells in that cancerous tumor are now operating or vibrating at a specific resonant frequency. We know this for a fact. If I have a device that actually can match the frequency of that tumor, I can send a cancellation frequency to that tumor. You're talking about a Rife machine. Something like a Rife machine. I can destroy it without destroying the surrounding tissue, right? So imagine having the capability of now understanding on a more grand scale, a dimension, fifth dimension, like somebody there obtains the frequency of the third dimension. They can just come right on through. This could be some of the reason for paranormal activity and things like that. It could be entities or entities or beings having a peek into our world, into our dimension. It might not be anything scary at all, you know, in some cases. Will it scare us? Maybe, yeah, because we can't perceive them as to what they truly appear and look like. But it could be a higher dimensional being coming, coming to have a look around. They could be on vacation. I mean, theoretically, <laughs> you know. I don't know who the hell is going to come on vacation to this world, buddy. But, <laughs> but it's uh, something to look at. It's a, we're, this is a reality show. Okay, yeah. we're on season twenty twenty three. That's just the way it is, man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's so. There's eleven frequencies. Eleven who, dimensions. Who came up with this? Oh, big time theoretical physicist uh, Michio Kaku, uh, Professor James Gates Jr., and many other super super symmetry experts. Uh, And then, now, I've been talking about the fact that if there's 11 dimensions, that our mind connects to also 11 dimensions for over a decade. And if you go back and look at some of those old posts, people were calling me a kook, a crazy, a tinfoil wearing hat, pseudoscientist, blah, blah, blah. Well, two years ago, scientists at the Brain Institute discovered that the human mind connects to what? 11 dimensions. So now, 
My theory was accurate. Science has proved it. And theoretical physicists say that there are 11 dimensions. So our minds, our consciousness is multidimensional. And everything that, everything that exists in the third dimension that we, had a part, uh, we took part in creating, it started all on the multidimensional platform. So this chair that we're sitting in right now, a person thought about this chair first before, before it manifested as solid matter, but they thought about it on the multidimensional platform, higher dimensional thinking, the original platform before all these other platforms came out. And in that realm, it existed and was constructed in a higher dimension. Then what happens is the person who was thinking about creating this chair collapsed it from multi-dimensions into two dimensions. How? By drawing it on a piece of paper. Then it went from there probably into a computer nowadays, which is a CAD, Computer Assisted Design, which is still 2D, even though it gives you the illusion of 3D in the computer. All computer screens are just two-dimensional objects. And from there it gets sent, now the data from it gets sent to an engineer who now crafts it into a three-dimensional object that we can maneuver in XYZ axis in space-time. So this chair that I'm sitting in and you're sitting in started off, it was created in multi-dimensions and then collapsed into a three-dimensional structure that we're sitting on right now. Very interesting, very interesting. <clears throat> Let's talk about I got a whole list of stuff to talk about with it. <laughs> Let's talk about uh, the Book of Enoch. Oh, man, the Book of Enoch, powerful book. You know that Enoch was a real powerful man because he's talked about in the Bible, yet his book is not in the Bible. <laughs> it was left out by accident on purpose. And the reason why is because he's talking about, and he calls these beings by their names, beings that were not from earth, that came here from up above and engaged mankind. They taught us how to build weapons. They taught us about perfume and makeup. They taught us, taught us how to make jewelry and beer and all this other crazy stuff, right? So these beings uh, were physical corporeal beings. They actually, at some point, even went to war with humans against other humans, putting on clothing and getting swords and everything else. They were having sex with humans. So these weren't like the angels that we're thinking with the fluffy wings and these were people. I think there was a misconception in some cases as to what is an angel and what is a person based on the level of technology and, and the consciousness of, that, of those beings. I think that the people were, uh, became like a cargo cult. In other words, they deified some of these people, even though they weren't deifiable. They were just people with more advanced knowledge. Um, and so these beings did this. They engaged mankind. They also gave Enoch an appointed date that they were going to take him into space to go meet the master. Who is Enoch? Enoch is, uh, well, he's a, he's, he's a half human, half Anunnaki, according to some of the texts. So one of these, he's a quote unquote demigod, supposedly. So he was, the, 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 his, his father was a god with a lowercase g, and his mother was a human being, supposedly. This is what the stories say. How mythological is that? We can't really understand it. But he was special. He had offspring, he had a family. And these beings that came to visit gave him an appointed date that he would be taken away from Earth. And so he got taken away from Earth, and he, he didn't describe the shape of the Earth, the, big, the size, the color, everything from space, a gigantic blue glowing sphere. He's then brought back at some point in the future. He went away for a while, then comes back. He left the, the, he left the, um, the, the, the I guess, his estate to his kids, his, his, his sons. So they were waiting for him to leave, and they was also waiting for him to come back. This was planned. It wasn't like some mystical thing. In the Bible, it seems as if he just disappeared from earth and he was taken into heaven and never came back, but that's not the case. In the, in the book of Enoch, you find out he was brought back. Pretty interesting. <laughs> uh, but also what's interesting about Enoch is uh, he came back with some advanced knowledge and understanding about construction techniques. Okay. So all of a sudden, this guy understands and knows how to build megalithic structures. Who taught him this information? Wherever he went, he became a student. And they brought him back and he had this knowledge and this wisdom. There's only one Bible that exists with the full book of Enoch in the same Bible, and that's the Ethiopian Bible. It's a really, really old, old Bible, long before the Sinai Bible, long before the King James Version, uh, out of Ethiopia, right where actually a lot of the Jewish people are. There's black Jews in Ethiopia, which I'm going to go see them next year when I go down to the Lalibela Temples, which is a mountain that was carved into a temple from the outside going in, just like Abu Simbel and Petra Jordan. 
And so, ironically, right there in that same area, they've got the Bible with the book of Enoch inside of it. But the reason why it was left out is because he was taken away, taught an advanced construction knowledge that nobody had the capability of knowing. And he was also, um, you know, he, he also had a record of these beings that were engaging the people um, in a way that it didn't seem like, it didn't seem too godly, let's put it that way. And so that part was left out as well. Why did he, why do you think Enoch was chosen? It may have been chosen because according to the ancient records, his, you know, his father wasn't human. In other words, he was half Anunnaki or Atlantean in some way. Just like Zeozidra, a.k.a. Noah, was also half Anunnaki or Atlantean. Uh, in the Epic of Gilgamesh, same scenario, I believe it was Enki that was his father. And when, when Noah was born, or Zeozidra is his real name, when he was born, he didn't look like his you know, brothers and sisters or his family members. His hair was different, his eyes were a different color, his skin was a different color and everything else. So it's pretty interesting. And so again, he was spared. And when he got spared in the ancient Sumerian tablets, Anki and Enlil, they had a big fight because Enlil wanted the people to be wiped out and Anki saved enough people that they can survive and re-kickstart civilization. I want to move into some of the other ancient ruins. Yeah. Easter Island. Oh, man, Easter Island. Easter Island really catches my attention. In fact, I looked at getting there. It seems like it's... It's hard. It's it's not easy. They don't have... There's not very many flights going in and out of there no. at all. I've been trying to go to Easter Island for the last 10 years. You can't get in? Not only can you cannot get in, you, when nobody's going to get in now because they just went there. Somebody went there and lit that place on fire. Yes. What? They burned down the majority of the Moai heads. They they put some type of a chemical on the Moais and lit that on fire, which melted solid stone. When did this happen? That happened in uh, October of 2022. Yeah. Somebody went there and ruined it. Yeah. How? Did, first of all, you know, it's inside. How do you get that much fuel, first yeah. of all, on the island? It's hard to get there. How do you get the fuel there? And whatever was, was added to this fuel or whatever type of fuel it was... I mean, who, who had the approval to bring that kind of chemical through international waters onto that island to then have the time to put it on top of the stone and then to actually light them all on fire? There's not trees. There's no trees on Easter Island. There's nothing to keep the flames going. So somebody manually had to go and burn all these heads. So now with that, uh, that being destroyed, and my biggest dream was to go there because those bodies... Their heads are just the top of the body. There's full bodies underneath the ground that go down for meters. And their hands are holding weapons in some cases. They have technology in their hands. They're kind of, you know, etched into the side of the bodies. But these things are super megalithic. And the reason why the heads are above the ground is because there was obviously a global flood. And that's a mud flow that covered these things up. That's why some of them are tilted over and falling over in different angles. That's the mud flow of the water coming out the ocean and then running it, running across the, the, the land and the mud piling up on top of these things. That's why the bodies are completely covered in dirt and soil. Um, but yeah, incredible place. The, the heads are, you know, pointed at different star systems. Um, there's similar heads like you can find in South America. Really? Yeah, similar with the body still attached. So again, linking the cultures, showing that there's this link that there wasn't just isolated civilizations, that this was a, at one point a global civilization. Uh, and these Moai heads and their bodies are very similar to the Toltecs in Mexico. If you go to Tula, Mexico, and climb to the top of the, the, the Kilkulkan uh, house, which is a, like a half pyramid, at the top there's gigantic Toltecs, which resemble the bodies of these um, Moais in Easter Island. And so it's an incredible place, in my, in my opinion, more evidence of an ancient astronaut theory that existed uh, and uh, remnants of an ancient civilization that we'll probably never know about. And now with the fires destroying everything, you know, who knows? I had no idea that fires destroyed those. Yeah. You think that was done on purpose? Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, I mean to destroy? To destroy the evidence. Too many people want to figure out like the bodies and everything. Too many good ideas started coming up showing the evidence of the mud flow that covered the bodies and, and everything else. And um, the technology that was in their hands, you know, analyzing and trying to really understand what is it and how it linked to other cultures around the world. And now, again, somebody else at a very high level 
wiped out more history. Let's move into Stonehenge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, you, what is that? Stonehenge is a gigantic place that allows you to do star alignments and also harness frequencies. Stonehenge may, may have been also a portal generator. There's, a, there's been accounts, I've been on different TV shows on like Discovery Channel and Science Channel talking about Stonehenge, where there's been accounts where people disappeared, all right? Where a weird lightning storm comes out of nowhere, and this is back before they put up the gates and the fences and all that, and all of a sudden people just scream and then disappear from, from the center of the circle. And so it may be some type of a portal generator, maybe it harnessed some type of energy or magnetic field of the earth and opened up a portal, it could be an ancient communication device. It might have been multifunctional, just like the Great, uh, Great Pyramid at Giza. It could be a multifunctional device, star alignments, communication, and portal generation as well. Is it aligned with anything? Is it, is it positioned in any certain particular way, like the pyramids? Yeah, all, all star alignments. It, it aligns with specific stars and solstices that happen around the planet. The summer solstice, the winter solstice, all those alignments can be found right there at Stonehenge. And it's also rumored to have been built by who? Though the Atlantean priest king from the Emerald Tablets. What, when you say aligned yeah. to certain stardust mm -hmm. uh, systems, what, what, do you, what do you mean? So if you look at, at the stones in a specific way, there's like sometimes there's little keyholes on them and things like that. The sun will shine directly through those little tiny keyholes that are carved out of the stone. They'll drop. It'll it'll shine directly into maybe to the center of the of the circle. Um, these 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 uh, alignments happen at specific times of the year. So whoever built this, they had a lot of celestial knowledge of days, months, years, times, and also of course the angles of the sun and how to capture the sun and illuminate certain areas of the hinge just like they did at uh, Abu Simbel in Egypt, where you have um, this uh, mountain that was carved from the outside going in, and in the back of this temple that was carved out of solid stone of a mountain, there are uh, three gods sitting there, all right? And then the sun during the solstice comes through this tiny little hole in the top of the, the, the temple, the, the face of the temple, and it shines directly on and illuminates these gods in the back of this temple. If you're off by one millimeter when you start the first cut, you can't make it a perfect cut. You can't make this thing happen. So again, it's all the same people, I think, you know, the same knowledge and understanding of, of the sun and the angles and, and the solstices and star alignments. Um, you know, you, <clears throat> you've obviously, you've been doing this for a long time. Yeah. What, are some, what are some less known structures that really fascinate you? Oh yeah, wow. So in Turkey, you have something called Gobekli Tepe, which a lot of people know about Gobekli Tepe. Now it's been made famous because why it predates now even Sumerian culture, even though Sumerian culture goes back way beyond that, technically with the tablets, but they're saying now, okay, the earth isn't, I mean, the, the, the history isn't 6,000 years old. We can go back to 13,000 now because we know this was an advanced culture 13,000 years ago. But over there, there's also another place called Karahan Tepe. Karahan Tepe, in my opinion, is even older. Um, and so I, did, I think a lot of people don't know about these places, these sites that exist. They have these gigantic stone pillars, and on these pillars are etched animals that are not from that region. So how, they, how, how do people know what the animals look like in other parts of the world to etch them into these gigantic megalithic stone pillars? Pretty interesting. And the other thing about that area is <clears throat> the majority of it was covered up by sand, but not sand from the area. Somebody covered that entire area with sand from over 400 miles away. Really? Yeah, crazy. Just wild stuff, pretty interesting. There's also a place called over there called Darren Kuyu. Now Darren Kuyu, I've gotta get there next year. I couldn't make it because the whole global sickness came and then I, all the flights got canceled. Uh -huh. Then when I finally had a flight to go there, they had an earthquake. <laughs> And the whole airport, you know, got destroyed and everything. I, I think they've rebuilt the airport now. So I'm going to go there next year. But Darren Kuyu is an underground base built in ancient times thousands of years ago that was designed to house over 30,000 people, including livestock. 
And at the uh-huh. deepest levels, you can go down there, there's been no signs of collapse, and there's 14,000 ventilation shafts that go to the deepest levels to bring oxygen, no matter how deep you are in the, in the uh, place. And it's one gigantic rolling stone door that an average small person can just roll with their hand and seal it from the inside, but from the outside, it's impenetrable. No kidding. Yeah. I've seen, I have seen a little bit of information on this. Okay. I'd love to go there too. Yeah, that's an incredible place, incredible place, yeah. Have you been to all these places? I haven't been to, I haven't been to Turkey. I, that, you know, that earthquake ruined my second opportunity, the yeah. sickness and then the earthquake, but I'm going to get there next year. Um, but I've been to a lot of places, but uh, this year I'm going back to Egypt again with a group of 70 people, taking them on a private VIP tour. Uh, then I'm going to do a second tour for a smaller group for four days, and then I'm going to go to Cambodia right after that and take people on a tour through Cambodia, through Angkor Wat, Tao Prom, all these other ancient sites out there. What's going on over there? You know, Angkor Wat's an amazing place. It's the largest temple complex in the world. And actually, the X-Men mansion from X-Men is, is based on the Angkor Wat uh, temple. Really? This is a megalithic temple that has a super megalithic Olympic-sized swimming pool on the second floor, made out of solid stone. <laughs> Can you imagine the weight? Imagine the water, with the water in it, what the weight is. Yeah. How do you build a structure that can disperse evenly that amount of weight load without collapse? Who has the technology, the understanding, the, the physics knowledge to build that structure? It's such an, a massive structure. And according to the, the homegrown people, the, the indigenous people, it was built in a day and a night. By who? By the, the brothers that came down from the heavens. So... In some way, these people show up. What type of technology they use, nobody knows, but they built this according to them in a day and a night. And it's weird how the actual structure looks like it was poured into place. It looks like molten rock. It's an incredible temple. If you ever get a chance to go to Angkor Wat, I highly, highly recommend it. And then at Ta Prom, I love taking people there because it's an ancient temple, thousands of years old, thousands of years old, but in the actual relief of the building, there's carvings in stone. One of them is a stegosaurus. What's that doing there? What is a dinosaur with the meat on its bones doing carved into an ancient temple? There's only one reason. They knew what a dinosaur looked like because obviously at some point we walk amongst dinosaurs. So That's in there. That's in there. Yeah. Yeah. So... Uh, and just, just so many other incredible like discoveries. It's like it's like a real incredible place. Um, I highly recommend you know Cambodia. There's a river called the River of a Thousand Lingas with these carved structures underneath the flowing water, all the way down the river out of solid stone. How in the world do you carve solid stone structures underneath a flowing river? I mean, it's mind-boggling stuff. It's just. <laughs> It's mind-boggling. That's that Kulin Mountain. So we'll, we'll hike up Kulin Mountain. We'll see the, the, the Thousand Linga River, and then we'll go swimming at the waterfall with the monks. It's going to be an incredible trip. So just incredible stuff. Just places that people, you know, out there that you, you never think existed, but they're out there. You know, <clears throat> I can't wait to go to – I got to do – I got a kid, yeah. and I got another one on the way. They're Man. very <laughs> – one of the – is two. Yeah. Getting ready to be two. And um, when they're a little bit older – I'm definitely yeah. You gotta <laughs> I'm gonna do go it. on some of these excursions with you. You got to do it, man. I'm taking my my stepson Gabriel with me to uh, Egypt. He'll be there for the second part of the trip, the, the four day tour. I know he can handle four days. He's ten, but he'll love climbing inside the pyramids. I'm gonna take him all inside the shafts, places where nobody's allowed to go. Uh, you know, miles and miles of inner shafts of the like the bent pyramid that people you know nobody ever spends an hour or two inside of there, but we can. And I'll take him all the way to the top of the pyramid from the inside. You get access to all this stuff. Yeah, I have VIP access to all this stuff. The Sphinx, I'll take you underneath the Sphinx. Nobody can even touch the Sphinx. Everybody has to go on a, a ramp on the side about 100 yards away. I'll take you right in between the Sphinx's paw, let you touch the dream cell and take a photo with you right there. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. That would be amazing. Yeah. <clears throat> so I want to get into Antarctica. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. You know, we... It really sparked my interest. I had uh, when we met at Dr. Greer's conference, mm-hmm. you know, with Eric Hecker. Yeah, he talked about how Raytheon has a facility down there. Mm-hmm. I'd had people email in about this guy Admiral Byrd, who yeah. was a famous explorer, World War II. Yeah, um, 
World War II admiral. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> had done a lot of exploring down there. And then, you know, the more I dig into this, it's just... Yeah, that's a wild story. <laughs> it is. You know, we got the... In 1954, Admiral Byrd quoted, Antarctica in the future would become the most important place in the world for, for science. Mm -hmm. um, Rockefeller yeah. was part, was a big patron of Byrd's expeditions to mm -hmm. the North Pole oh, yeah. and the South Pole. Why do you think Admiral Byrd and the Rockefellers were so mm -hmm. much more interested in yeah. Antarctica, the South mm -hmm. Pole, rather than the North Pole, yeah. having been to both? Well, you know, he had been to both. He had been to the North Pole uh, in, uh, in, the in the 1920s. And he had seen that, but there is a situation that began to happen during World War II where they discovered that the Nazis had went down to Antarctica and built the base down there, New Schwabenland. And they were like, wait a minute, why in the world would they go to this desolate place? What's down there that they would want to go and, 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 and go through the harsh weather and risk everything, risk even their lives to be down there and build a base? So he decided to fly down there. Now, there's an incredible story that was in, in uh, Admiral Byrd's diary that was found by his kids, where he said he flew into an area that opened up at Antarctica, and he went into an area where it was lush and tropical almost. And as he got into this area, this is according to his own diary. People can look this up. Something took over his plane. And these two UFO type craft, circular craft, flying saucers came and it took over his craft and it guided him in to this area where they landed. And then they took him to meet somebody that he calls in his diary, the master. Um, pretty interesting story. And according to this account, the, the, the Nazis had gotten help to create these craft called the Hanabuf. They had four versions of this craft, these circular disc craft from these people down there. Um, but the, the guy, this master, told him that they were weary of the, uh, the nuclear bombs that had just you know, been utilized, uh, dropped the nuclear in Japan and so forth, and they were wary of our experimentation with nuclear devices and wars because they're sharing this planet as well. Pretty interesting story. Um, and so, you know, all of a sudden, Admiral Byrd's going down there with a fleet, not just a small fleet. He took over 3,000 people with him. This was a huge expedition. It was a military expedition. When he got down there, there he had a situation where some of these flying objects were attacking some of their ships and actually destroyed some of them. Sent him back home packing with his tail between his legs. This was one of the top admirals, literally the top admiral in the world at the time for the United States military. And he said, he said that we have a new enemy that can fly from pole to pole with extreme speed. Why would he make a statement like that? And then all of a sudden, you know, these Nazi, they are rumored to have these craft, which some of the designs have been found, called Hanabu. And uh, these Hanabu craft had the capability of using, utilizing uh, a couple different forms of, of uh, propulsion. One was jets, so they can take off vertically. They had little jets that would thrust and take off vertically. But then from there, they can shoot off horizontally. Well, they were using a, a device that was spinning in the center of the uh, of the craft. And what it appears to be is they began to copy technology from the ancient Indian Vedas because Hitler was sending his people all around the world to get knowledge on ancient technology. That's how they found these people in Antarctica. He even sent people to Tibet, Nazis to Tibet, to talk to the people in Tibet to find out about this ancient technology. He found out about Bamanas, and these people supposedly in Antarctica helped him develop uh, a couple of them where they use a ferrofluid vortex engine. A ferrofluid is a liquid metal like mercury. And in the ancient Indian Vedas, if you take mercury and rotate it at a high, high rotation, a high RPM and electrify it, you get something called anti-gravity. So he was utilizing something that had rotating disks underneath these round craft, according to eyewitness accounts, and also the schematics that were discovered during the collapse of Nazi Germany. Um, and it's pretty interesting that I think besides the uranium that's down there in Antarctica, which obviously you know what uranium is used for, right? Uh -huh. Nuclear power plants and also nuclear weapons. There's mountains. Uh, he, Admiral Byrd said there were mountains of coal with no ice caps, no ice caps. His exact words, and I have a, I can give you a copy to this video. His own mouth is saying no ice. 
mountains of coal that can satisfy the world's need for coal for a very, very, very long time. Also, there's plutonium down there. Again, so uranium and plutonium, we know that if you have a high level of plutonium and uranium, it's one of the easier uh, elements that you can separate the atoms. You can split atoms very easily, which makes it high use for weaponry and also, also power plants. So that's why the, the government wanted access down there. That's why the, the Germans wanted access down there. Um, and that's why after Germany fell, we had Project Paperclip, where we took all the scientists from Germany that had learned all this wisdom and knowledge, and we brought them to America. People think Project Paperclip was just a small number of Nazis. We took over 2,000 Nazis with us and brought them to America and put them in positions of power over technology companies, the CIA, the space program at NASA, and so forth and so on. And we began to develop these technologies. So in a weird kind of way, America became the Fourth Reich, to be honest with you. Uh, and I know that they were developing at the time the Hanabu Number no. 4, which supposedly Hitler never got killed. He escaped in Hanabu Number no. 4 to Argentina, which is very, very close to where? Antarctica. If you look at Google Sky right now on the computer and look down on Antarctica, you'll find bases from uh, re research bases from every major country in the world there. And you'll also find the Rockefeller Foundation base as well. So Admiral Byrd was right. All the technology and research is the number one place in the world for technology research is right down there in Antarctica. I believe that as the ice is melting, they're finding remnants of an ancient civilization. We know that Antarctica was not a frozen tundra for 12 million years like main scientists want you to. Mainstream scientists, 12 million years to build up all this ice. No, 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 that's not accurate. We know this because of the Perry Reese map. The Perry Reese map shows Antarctica, what it looked like without ice on it. And that's not even that old. So we know that Antarctica shifted into that spot. How? Because we know that Antarctica is surrounded by tectonic plates. And so that landmass was on a plate that slipped and had, there, was a, there was something called a pole shift of the crust of the earth, which shifted it from a more habitable climate into the position it is now. And that's why the animals that are being uncovered from the ice were flash frozen with undigested food in their stomachs. And there's an entire advanced civilization there, including some of the largest pyramids on earth, right in Antarctica. That's what I wanted to get to is the, so apparently the pyramids down there are a lot, they're a lot bigger than the oh, ones in, in super in Egypt. Like they make the one in, at Giza, the Great Pyramid, look like, uh, you know, a, 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 a buggy, a dune buggy. I mean, these things are super massive. Do you know anything about them? No, there's not a lot. There's only a couple things we know. Like one of the pyramids is two kilometers by two kilometers by two kilometers by two kilometers at the oh, base. Oh, wow. Okay. The height is just, you know, it's massive. It's just, it's, it's way up there. Like, you know, it's in the thousands of feet. But also one former military person that was a, um, a, uh, a source for Linda Moten Howe, this was on a documentary she was in. She said that that source told her after going down there for research, I guess in private security, that it was still emitting some type of exotic energy, which is pretty interesting because that was the second time I heard a statement like that. This, the first time was on a documentary that came on Discovery Channel about the Bermuda Triangle when they found those pyramids off the coast of Cuba down there, all right? which is clearly scanned. Everybody knows that they, they exist. But this guy was taking a little, he would get off the boat and take like a dinghy out to float to the center area. And he said the same thing. Some type of exotic energy was draining his batteries on his cameras. He had to do try three times to get this thing recorded properly. He said exotic energy. And what's interesting is if you take um, a perfect line and draw it from the tip of the Bermuda Triangle, the center of the Bermuda Triangle, straight through the earth, you come out at the Yonaguni Pyramid at the Dragon's Triangle in Japan which is also rumored to have uh, disappearances and exotic energy and all this other crazy stuff. So in some way, these pyramid structures around the world are all linked with potentially portals of some type or energetic portals. Interesting. Just some, um, some facts about Antarctica. It's 5 million square miles, 99% of it is covered with ice. It's the highest, driest, and coldest continent on Earth. Record Negative 130 degrees Fahrenheit. It's the fifth, lar fifth largest co continent, yeah. twice the size of Australia. 
Seventy percent of the planet's fresh water yeah. comes from Antarctica. There are rivers and lakes underneath the ice. Mm -hmm. The difference between the North and South Pole, the North Pole ice, <clears throat> the North Pole is ice over water and it's 10,000 feet deep into the ocean. Mm. The South Pole is ice over land and is 10,000 feet high. That's the center of the plateau. Yeah. And then goes on to talk about the pyramid structures. Yeah. We also signed a treaty, mm -hmm. the Antarctica Treaty. Do you know about this? Yeah, that treaty was to allow peaceful collaboration of research and science down there, no war zone. Um, you can actually go down there. There's a guy who's got a new show on my TV network called, his name is Brad Olson. It's called The Secrets of Antarctica. He went down there, and so we're documenting the whole thing. He went down there. He he pulled up on the research facilities. He had to get approval to come on land. They wouldn't let him inside of the facilities, but he did get a chance to go down there. So people who say it's impenetrable and no human being, could, no civilian can get there, that's actually not true. You actually can. It's very expensive and it's very uh, taxing on the body, but you can get down there. Um, and so uh, it's pretty interesting. So that'll be coming out soon. But uh, that re th there's an opening next to these research facilities. And this is why I believe they made this treaty, this sharing of information treaty or whatever. There's a 30 meter wide opening there. You can see it on, 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 the, on the Google Sky thing. And what's interesting, or Google Earth, I'm sorry. And when you look at it, like what's in there? Now, why are they over here? And why are they so close to this gigantic opening? What's in there? And I think this, the answer is whatever Admiral Byrd came across, across or whatever they're coming across, I think it's linked. I think there's a remnant of an ancient civilization in there that possibly is still there um, and they're in communication with them, in my opinion. Another thing that backs this up, I took a remote viewing course with Major Ed Dames, Project Stargate, former CIA uh, United States. And his project was for remote viewing. So I took a course with him several years. He was mm -hmm. my actual teacher, my direct teacher. It wasn't like I was under some other people that worked with him. No, he was my direct teacher. There's pictures of me with this man. And he told me that there's beings that have easy and free access to come and go as they please from Antarctica. And at one of these classes, we just had, that was, class was over. It was like a 10 hour class. We were just sitting around talking, having a casual conversation. He told me a few other things, but that was one of the things that kind of stood out. And he says they, they come and go as they please because nobody can stop them. Very interesting. Yeah. What do you make of Eric Hecker's testimony? Oh, it's pretty interesting, man. Look, I mean, a lot of these guys are pretty shaken up, mm -hmm. you know. Um, you know that from how hard it is for them to talk about what happened, that they went through something. It's pretty clear to see that something happened uh, that affected them in a way that they'll probably never be the same again. You know, so um, when you see that, you have to say, man, what what happened? And, you know, you have to almost kind of take them for their word. Now, there's always my story, your story and the truth. Right. There's always a combination of all. But from these guys perspective and from my perspective, looking in, I believe, honestly, that, um, you know, that something happened and uh, they're doing the best. He's doing the best he can to describe what it was. Are you familiar with the the bell? The Nazi bell, the die Glock? Yes. Yeah. Can you talk about that? knowledge. I, you know about all of it. <laughs> the die Glock. The die Glock is an amazing device that was being developed by the Nazis during World War II. This die Glock, again, technology that they learned about through uh, an advanced civilization that they were in communication with through the Thule Society. This Thule, T H U L E, Thule Society, they were using psychics to channel information from an advanced alien race. And they were taking this knowledge and then turning it into actual, real, workable technology. And so they had this thing in Germany called the Henge, where they had these gigantic stone pillars in the, in the shape of a hinge. And they had the Diglock in the middle. It was a, it looked like an, uh, an acorn, a UFO type, but an acorn shaped UFO. And it had these multi counterclockwise spinning pieces on it that was spinning all different ways. Um, the ultimate purpose of it seems to have been some type of time travel. And this thing at one point, based on eyewitness accounts, it's turned on and activated and it, choop, it disappeared from the hinge. It was seen like 
I forget how many decades later. I think it crashed somewhere in Virginia or something, according to these accounts. I got to look that up to get make sure I'm not making you know making a mistake there. But it it reappeared later, and it crashed somewhere I believe in the Americas. Um, and this thing was the same exact shape and description as the Die Glock. And what was it for? I believe that they were trying to tap into time travel so that they can go back in time and change the past so they can have a Nazi dominant future. You see, they want to alter realities. The only problem with going back in time they didn't take into consideration is that if you go back in time, you can't alter the future reality that you existed in on the same timeline. Because when you go back in time, you shift into a different alternate timeline altogether, allowing you to go back in time in the first place and see even yourself. So it's like the grandfather paradox, right? If you go back in time and kill your grandfather, how in the world were you born to go back in time to kill your grandfather? Well, the answer is you shift into an alternate timeline. Now, going into the future, you stay on the same timeline. We know this because time travel into the future happens every day. Even when you get on an airplane, you travel into the future based on relativity, the person standing still on the ground and you moving across the sky in a plane, we know that you're moving forward in time by microns of tenths of a second, but you're moving in time. Same thing with astronauts when they travel into space. We know for a fact that because they're traveling at high speeds, they come back, uh, you know, microns of a second younger than us. So traveling into the future, you can stay on the same timeline, but going into the past, you can't. So that whole thing would have failed anyway. Interesting. Yeah. Fascinating stuff. Let's take another break. When we come back, I want to talk a little bit about uh, Elon Musk and okay. the big push to settle Mars. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. Cool. You've heard the buzz about ketone supplements and how they can boost your workouts by helping your body use fatty acids for fuel. I take a shot of HVMN ketone supplement before my morning workout. It's focused energy. It's not an energy drink, though. It's like a feeling of being in the zone. I don't feel hyper jittery, anxiety, stuff like I get when I drink too much coffee. They're great for cycling, long runs, and all kinds of workouts, and can help you stay sharper on a regular basis. We also just received some exciting news. In addition to being available in select Equinox gyms, Ketone IQ can now be found in local Sprout stores nationwide. I wish I'd had this product when I was on active duty. I get better endurance, I don't get the crash, and it helps curb my appetite. HVMN is offering my audience 30% off your first subscription order of Ketone IQ. You can save 30% off your first subscription order of Ketone IQ at hvmn.com slash Sean. Again, visit hvmn.com slash Sean and subscribe upon checkout for 30% off. You know, whenever I look at pictures of my kids from the past year or even just a few months ago, I am amazed at how fast they're growing up. And then it hits me hard. I'm getting older too. That's why planning for my family's financial security has become a top priority. Making sure we're prepared and have enough life insurance in case something unexpected happens and I'm out of the picture is crucial. And Fabric by Gerber Life makes it simple to get the protection that's right for your family. Fabric by Gerber Life was designed by parents for parents to help you get a high quality, surprisingly affordable term life insurance policy in less than 10 minutes. You could go to start from covered in less than 10 minutes with no health exam required. With over 1,800 five-star reviews, they're rated as excellent on Trustpilot. Join the thousands of parents who trust Fabric to protect their family. Apply today in just minutes at meetfabric.com slash Sean. That's meet fabric.com slash Sean, M-E-E-T, fabric.com slash Sean. Policies issued by Western Southern Life Assurance Company, not available in certain states, prices subject to underwriting and health questions. All right, Billy, we're back from the break. I want to talk about Mars. So yeah. we see Mars and just space in general. We see as time goes on, we see more and more billionaires, trillionaires, yeah. Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, Richard Branson. I mean, there's this obsession with yeah. space. Yeah. And Elon says, I believe he wants to occupy Mars by, is it 2025? Yeah. And <clears throat> what? why is the fascination in space? Has all of Earth been discovered? I mean, what, uh, what's... No. 
Is it hopeless here? Why is everybody moving to space? Yeah, well, they're in their mind, it's hopeless here. And so uh, we we haven't even, you know, really looked at the oceans that much. There's so much going on here on this planet. We haven't explored a lot of Earth. There's so much more to explore. However, based on the way we're set up as a global economic system, and you look at what's going on, it just seems to a lot of billionaires that the next big move is, you know, let's go create a breakaway civilization and start our own thing over here, basically is what it is. And so we know that Mars has a lot of data over the last several decades. Why? Because we've sent so many missions to Mars, and so has Russia as well. If you look at the total amount of missions to Mars with rovers and satellites and calculate the expenditure, you're in the trillions of dollars. Now, why would anybody spend trillions of dollars to go visit a cold, dry rock? So it makes these billionaires start asking questions, and then they're in the in crowd so they can get some answers, and they find out that Mars is not exactly what we've been told in terms of habitability. We found out that Mars, we were told, was a cold, dry rock with no magnetic field, and DNA would just unravel based on the radiation. All of a sudden, the new science has come out. Earth, Mars has a rotating magnetic field. And not only that, it spins on its axis almost at the same exact speed of Earth. So a day on Mars is like 23.5 hours. And so that speed of the rotation on its axis creates something called bow shock, which bends and warps cosmic rays and radiation around the planet, along with the weakened magnetic field. You can actually survive. Anything with DNA can survive on the surface. Also now, the science data has come back from the REMS unit we sent there, and there's oxygen. There's, there is oxygen. There is oxygen on Mars. Yes, there's oxygen. Not only that, guess what they said about the soil? They said the soil on Mars is better for growing crops than the soil on Earth. <laughs> Are you serious? I'm dead serious. How would they know this, right? Also, there's not just oxygen, but all the other uh, gases that are needed to sustain biological life. Now, is oxygen still leaking into the atmosphere? Yes, it's still leaking out into the atmosphere, but there's somewhere being generated. They keep finding more and more oxygen is being generated from somewhere as it's leaking. So who's creating or what is creating this oxygen? I believe, my personal opinion, this is not in any science book, that there are trees and plant life on Mars based on some of the satellite images that I've seen. I'm gonna send you some to show to your viewers with the source links and the source, with the source, they can look it up themselves and see for themselves what I'm looking at. I believe that there's a source that is generating and they've also found a lot of methane. Why is there methane? Methane is usually a byproduct of a biological process. There's a lot of methane on Mars, which means something is alive and something is creating waste product. Now, I don't see any cows on TV on Mars, so something's up there. Uh, they don't want to tell us what it is. So my personal opinion, based off of my research and what I've seen in some of these anomalies that exist in the images, they are building a breakaway civilization on Mars because that's the next big place to go and create their own thing. And there's an infrastructure that is being built there for a very, very long time. And when they arrive, they are going to inhabit those infrastructures. They're not going to be living in a tin can and living in, walking around in a spacesuit until they die. Billionaires that have the creature comforts of this planet, oceans, lakes, rivers, private jet flights, parties and mansions and everything else, aren't going to go live in a tin can until they die. There's something up there that they know exists and they're going to live in it. Most of it, I believe, is under underground, subterranean, uh, and that's where they're going. And uh, it's a great place to become an explorer. I wouldn't mind going to Mars. If I can get a way to get a ticket to Mars, I actually believe I would go. I would love to see some of these anomalies that I found up there with my own eyes. I, I need to correct myself. <clears throat> it's by 2050. 2050? Mars will be inhabited. Well, actually, he's changed that. Okay, look at some of the older articles. And originally, it was 2020. Then I believe it was 2025, then 2030. Now it's 2050. Originally, he wanted to take 80,000 people. Then it went up from there. I think it's now a million people he wants to do it with. So it keeps changing. You might have heard 2025 in your, or read it somewhere before, but it, the timeline keeps changing as technology, as the reality of the technology accomplishing its mission changes. And he's utilizing something extremely dangerous to get there. That would never go with Elon Musk technology because it has too many components. 
First, it has to lift off from Earth and go into space, not with no people on it. Then it's got to create this, build its own space little station up there, right? And it's going to fuel up. And then another thing has to launch and connect to that. And then they both have to take off and go to Mars. And then something's got to detach and go down to the surface and start building things and doing this and doing that and getting fuel ready for a return or whatever they need, forever, whatever uh, they need to create on the surface. And then after years of that going on, then people get in the ship and they take off and they re- this other thing has to come back and they got to connect to that and they got to ride that to Mars. It's like, come on. You know how many accidents can happen? <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> this is like a bad... Deck of cards just waiting to collapse. One mistake anywhere in any component and everybody's dead. So to me, it's, it's a joke. I mean, I, I, I'd rather go on Branson. Richard Branson has a better idea. He's got a space plane. It takes off. It flies into space. It comes back. It doesn't even have the heat tiles underneath it because it drops through the atmosphere and comes straight back in. And then it flies back to the ground. I'd rather go on something like that than go on something that has 100,000 connections that have got to be made before you can even step foot on the surface. Yeah, yeah. What, <clears throat> why do you think that, they, that these elitists are, are done here on Earth? You know, it's like, uh, how many times can you beat a dead horse? <laughs> and the big problem we have is a lot of people are waking up now, right? The evidence of that is that the fact that we're sitting here talking about this on this podcast to millions of people. I'm on mainstream TV shows. I'm on History Channel, Discovery Channel, Science Channel, Travel Channel. I'm on mainstream shows talking about these topics because people want to hear them now. When I first started talking about this stuff, I would hide in the bushes and talk to one like friend. And now all of a sudden I could talk to the world through many different platforms. So the world is waking up. The world is changing and becoming a much different place. And how long will it be before the people say, hmm, we're not going to play your game anymore. We're just done. And this whole thing shifts in another direction. Um, and that could cause a lot of turmoil in, in the transition process, a lot of wars, infighting, civil stuff, civil wars. It can cause uh, economic collapses, which can cause a lot of st- you know, starvation and, and poverty in the interim while things re- recoalesce. And they're thinking, you know what, how can we avoid all of this? Let's just go to Mars, start fresh. That's interesting. I mean, what do you, th- what do you th- in your mind... Do you, do you think this is going to happen by 2050? I believe it could happen before then, actually. Yeah, I think that the technology he's talking about utilizing is basing it on technology from like 2015. That, you know, any technology that he's using now was developed a de- uh, you know, 10 years ago. And so by 2050, you're talking about technology that he probably had developed maybe in 2038 or something like that. So I think it'll happen a lot sooner than that. Uh, and I also, I, I have a lot of, um, I'm an optimist. I have optimistic mentality. I believe that um, I have a lot of optimism in humanity that we are going to come through this time in our, in, our, in our short lifespan on this planet through what we're doing to each other, the divide and conquer tactics, the separation, the division. We're going to see through all, the, all this illusion that's been put on us and programmed into our bodies. I think eventually we're going to rise up and take back control of this planet, reform this global economic system in something that's positive, that works. And I believe we're going to start heading back towards the golden age again. Uh, There were golden ages in the past on this planet, and I believe that we're headed back to another one again. It's going to take some time. It's a gradual, slow process. But look where we came from in only 100 years, like I said earlier. Mm -hmm. A horse, buggy, and carriage are putting cars in space. So I believe that it's going to happen. I think that we've gotten past this nuclear scare, my personal opinion. Um, I think that the beings up there let us know by showing up at these flights and these missile silos and deactivating our nukes that we weren't going to be able to use them whether we wanted to or not anyway after what we did to Japan and so forth. And so I just believe that uh, we're in a stage right now where we got past destroying ourselves. And after we, after we get through this arduous process of learning how to walk, because we're children, we got to learn how to walk, then we'll learn how to run. It's going to take some time, but we'll get there. So if you look at Mars, you'll find that a lot of the anomalies are uh, kind of really resemble ancient structures on Earth. Not not only that, we've actually discovered things that look like, and we can't say they are because we're not there, that look like Ankhs. You know, the shape of the Egyptian Ankh. We found quite a few laying on the surface of Mars in different areas and so forth. How in the world can the Egyptian Ankh be on Mars? Things carved into size of mountains that look like Egyptian motif. Why would that be on Mars and on Earth? 
building piece remnants of what looks like ancient structures that resemble the same construction technique that we see in Peru and Bolivia and Egypt and everywhere else. And so it's like, why in the world would we see something so similar on Mars and on Earth? How, what is the connection? When you go into the ancient Sumerian tablets, you discover that there were beings living on Mars called the EGG in these ancient tablets. They were the working class Anunnaki people, and they were up there creating a breakaway civilization. But the atmosphere was very harsh as it is today. And so they were complaining to their rulers who were on Earth, Enki and Lil and Anu, that the conditions up there were kind of harsh and they don't mind it, but they would just like to have a break. And they also said, and by the way, we would love to have some women, too. They didn't have any women, supposedly. They wanted some women and they wanted to take a rest. And so they weren't given a break. And so in the epic of Atrahasis, they decided to go to war against the kings of Earth. These are the sons of God. These, and Anu was called the God figure, and his sons would be these Ajiji beings, the sons of God that fell to Earth and went against and rebelled against God. They came down from Mars to Earth. They encircled the campus at South Af in South Africa called um, Adam's Calendar. And the, the whole thing is scripted out in this tablet, how they were about to go to war, literally, and fight. And then Enki says, I have an idea. There's an existing hominid on this planet. We can add our essence to it and get it to bear your load. So an agreement was made and the war was thwarted that one time. But it, and eventually they did go to war. However, these beings were traveling back and forth from Earth to Mars. They had the same construction technique, the same concepts, the same knowledge and everything else, the same blueprints. And they were building a concurrent running civilization on Mars that was running on Earth. And that's why when you look at some of these images, we've downloaded, we meaning my team of anomaly hunters, have downloaded over a million images and have cataloged over 60,000 amazing anomalies from Mars image data that shows you this is not just uh, uh, you know, a rare thing, a rare occurrence. It's circumstantial evidence that links Mars to Earth. Another incredible thing, remember they took women, they said they took women back with them in this tablet. The human being, circadian rhythm, is actually more in tune to Mars daylight and night cycle than the Earth daylight and night cycle. That's real biology, real science. That's interesting. So all you start putting all these pieces of the puzzle together and all of a sudden, it looks like we have a direct connection with Mars, the god of war. And why the god of war? Because in that last war, according to the tablets, it extended all the way to Mars. And what has happened on Mars? It looks like it was in a war. And when you analyze the Mars Global Surveyor data and the other data from the rovers, you find that there's xenon in the atmosphere and xenon in the soil but not any kind of xenon, weapons-grade xenon. That's a byproduct of nuclear warfare. Where'd that come from? <laughs> Pretty interesting. Very interesting. <clears throat> Let's move into some consciousness stuff. Okay. So, so I would like to talk about quantum entanglement yeah. and consciousness and how they blend together. Yeah, beautiful. That's a huge topic. I talk about that in my Manifest Destiny classes every year because it's a huge topic for people to understand how they're manifesting and how they're even getting ideas. A lot of the times you're entangling with information. If you go into a laboratory and you take two particles and you use a laser with something called parabolic down conversion, you can get those particles on the same frequency. Once you get those particles to vibrate at the same frequency, you can entangle them. Once they're entangled, what happens is, let's say they were atoms, right? Mm -hmm. Atoms all have spin rates. So you can get one is spinning rating up and the other one is spinning down and they're entangled. If I take the atom that's spinning down and take it to the other end of the galaxy or the other end of the universe for that matter, if I had the capability, if I was to make the one local to me spin up, the one that's down will go up and vice versa. I can utilize that to send rudimentary communication through ups and downs, zeros and ones, right? So you have this entanglement that happens which bypasses the speed of light. It bypasses space-time. Einstein called it spooky action at a distance, right? So now what scientists discovered later on is that our thoughts phase in and out of this dimension, our synapses between our neurons and our own brain. They disappear sometimes and go where? They say that they're going and entangling with information in other dimensions, other places. So I began to hypothesize that this could be the, the reason behind 
ideas popping up in your head, people know, unknowingly developing the same uh, inventions at the same time in different parts of the world simultaneously, roughly around the same time, and also the capability for people to manifest things and attract things into their life. A lot of the times I believe that this way that you're thinking and focusing your mind, your, your brain, your, your, your conscious energy, it becomes a magnet. So if you look at Einstein's theory of relativity and you look at a planet, you'll see that a planet warps space around it. That's why gravity happens. Things fall toward the mass because space is warped, it's bent. Replace that planet with your consciousness. Now that's warping the ether of this, uh, this metaverse. And what's happening is things are falling toward you when you focus on them. The things that you want to bring into your life, negative or positive, whatever you focus on is, fall, is falling toward you. A lot of the times I believe that part of that falling toward, the initiation of it, is an entanglement. When you start to focus your mind heavily on a specific thing that you want to manifest into your life or bring into your reality, somehow those synapses entangle with something in the universe then the universe says, send this his way, send this her way, and it begins to fall toward you. And this is how I believe on the spiritual level, this ability for us to attract things into our life and attract our realities into our life based on what we're focusing on conscious thought happens. And what's interesting with the conscious thought is we now know that, like I said earlier, our mind is connecting to up to 11 dimensions, which is pretty interesting. So as you're focusing on things, you could even be connecting to information in higher dimensions. Could it be that some psychics, mystics, right? Edgar Casey, who would who would go into this type of a half daze and tap into information to give people cures for their illnesses and diseases that would actually work? Could he be tapping into quantum entangled thoughts that exist? He said he would send his mind out into the universe to get the answer because the answers already exist. And he would get the answer back. So in some way, I believe we're all entangling with information throughout the universe, it's just that sometimes we don't discern what that information is, and some people who seem to have these special abilities are able to discern the information as it comes back in, analyze it, and then it can actually even speak on it or utilize it in some way, shape, or form. Do you think everybody has these abilities? Yeah. I think everyone Only has Only a couple them. of us have developed them. Right. I think that we all had them at a higher level. If you look into the ancient texts again, there were people here already, and their bones have been found, bigger jaw bones much bigger skulls, which means bigger brains, not smaller brains, bigger brains. We know this because there's more mass capacity, more cranial capacity for mass in the skull area. And so we're talking about a very sophisticated cousin of ours that existed here before we, be we became Homo sapiens sapien. And I believe that we all have these abilities natural, you know, telekinesis, telepathy, psychic abilities, uh, and the ability to observe the Earth's magnetic field, all of that was built into us and still is. If you look right now in science, we have billions of magnetite crystals in our heads, but yet you and I can't navigate the earth without GPS. Why is that? Our, now our magnetite crystals are still tracking earth's magnetic field. We are completely unaware of it. They took a person, put him into a room, put a giant bar magnet over their head and put a, put a cap on your head to track the, the, the crystals or orientation. The crystals were tracking the orientation of the magnet. We, still, we should be able to navigate like turtles and birds do and so forth and else, but we don't have the ability to because why? We've lost our, our conscious awareness of what's already happening inside of us. Then we have a lot of junk DNA. I don't believe it's junk. I believe that that DNA used to be connected and that now it's been disconnected by some artificial force, which has disconnected us from a lot of our natural, everyday, birthright-given uh, abilities. What, what is junk DNA? What scientists say is junk DNA is just extra DNA that they have no idea what it's for. It's just kind of laying there, laying around, but it's not used for anything whatsoever. It just happens to just be in the body, but it's totally useless and not plugged into anything. Okay. But in my opinion, it's supposed to be plugged into something. It's supposed to be connected. It's supposed to be active. And, uh, you know, we know that DNA is a storage medium of information. Scientist named, a scientist named George Church took his ebook, which was... Um, I forget how many pages it was, a few hundred pages, even multimedia stuff in the book. He then transmitted that book from a computer onto DNA. And then he was able to transmit it back from the DNA back up to the server again into the book. He replicated it and then 80 billion times, 
the book. He replicated it on his computer 80 billion times and then put it on the DNA and it fit in, in one drop. One gram of DNA can hold over 433 petabytes of data. So they said, wait a minute, this is crazy. So Microsoft started experimenting with this too. So they were able to take data, zeros and ones, convert it into A's, C's, T's, and G's, which is what read write is on our DNA, and then put the data in a volume on DNA, and then take the data from the DNA and move it back into, from A's, C's, T's, and G's into zeros and ones and put it back on another computer. So now they have made a working DNA hard drive, which now you can store immense amount of information. They estimate that one human body can store 13.5 billion years of data. Wow. And how old is the universe? I have no idea. 13.5 billion years. Everything that exists, everything that's happened since the beginning of time is stored inside of your individual body and minds as well. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. I don't even know what to say to that. <laughs> it's massive. We're a walking universal library. We are the way for the universe to figure out and explore the third dimension and understand what it's like to be and live in the third dimension as every individual living thing. And we're all connected through this quantum entanglement. Every single, every single thing that exists is all connected, still connected. Space is an illusion, distance is an illusion, separation is all an illusion. What do you mean it's an illusion? We appear to be sitting in two separate chairs with a space in between us. Mm -hmm. But we're all atoms on an energetic grid that's connected and has always been connected. So the space in between us appears to be a distance, but if you go on the quantum level, you discover that we're both local. We're still in the same position, which is the original position. This entire universe is made up of a complete holography. We're living in a fractal holographic matrix, a matrix of light. And it doesn't take away from there being a creator because what I'm telling you about is the method used of this to make this creation. The method is a fractal holographic matrix, a matrix of light. Quantum physicists will tell you that a human being exists both as a wave of light and also solid matter. And they got the first image of a wave converting into solid matter on a, on a special type of camera. This is in physics.org. So in wave particle duality, they discovered that everything in the entire universe exists first as waves of light until a conscious observer interacts with it and then it collapses. This is hard to wrap your mind around, but imagine this, we're sitting here. Your house, it exists as a wave of potentials, not your house, it's a wave of light. Now the construction technique of the stacking of those atoms that built your house has a specific resonant frequency, so no matter who looks at it, it always collapses into the same exact shape. But if nobody's looking, it's just a wave of potentials. Until you see it, when you bend the corner, it collapses back into a solid structure. This is now well-known, proven science due to the double slit experiment. If you look that up, you'll find out they took a microscopic box, they put a little gun inside that can shoot individual electrons through slits inside the box to, sit, to hit the back wall. So the two slits here, and they want these particles to hit the back wall to see if it was gonna make a digital imprint on the back wall. Well, when they did this, when they looked, it was waves. So they said, wait a minute, how can there be a wave pattern on the back wall? We start individual single electrons through the slits. This should be dot, 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 dot. I said, we gotta look at this and see what's going on. So they put a camera in the box to see what was happening. When they looked, just looking, all of a sudden the electrons said, oh, you're looking at me? Okay, I'm gonna go back to being solid matter now. Dot, 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 dot. Took the camera away, waves. Put the camera back, dot, 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 dot. Oh, electrons are conscious. They, they are aware that they're being observed. And electrons orbit every atom in the universe, which means every atom is conscious. That means you think that you're sitting in a chair that's just made by man. We didn't make this chair. We stack atoms. We stack conscious atoms in a format that allowed us to sit on them. Everything is conscious. This chair is conscious. This suit is conscious. Everything is conscious because they're all made of atoms. And all we are ourselves are a stack of conscious atoms observing ourselves right now. You see? And so it gets really deep, man. It, I, mean, I, can go, I can go deeper and deeper, but it's pretty powerful stuff. Keep going. Keep going. <laughs> so the, the benefit of knowing this, imagine teaching your kids that everything that exists is conscious. A rock, a blade of grass, your clothing, even your book bag is aware. It's conscious. 
Imagine teaching them how to respect conscious things, the level of respect they will have for their personal items, their bike, their clothing, their book bag, their, you know, their schoolwork. Understanding and knowing that everything that they interact with, everything they touch or see, has a level of consciousness imbued into it. Now you're training your kid to be a, a, you know, a super conscious person that understands like treat everything that exists, no matter whether we think man made it or it's natural, with respect and dignity. That's the depth of understanding that people need to get to. And when we can get to that level of understanding, whew, wow. <laughs> so if we're all, st- if we're all, I mean, in which we are, I do understand, if we're all s- stacked atoms, yeah. stacked conscious atoms, yeah. <clears throat> what holds us together? Electromagnetic forces. That's what holds us together. You don't touch anything. So I may look like I'm touching this chair right now, right? I'm not actually touching the chair. You actually never touch anything. The repulsion of the electromagnetic frequency orbiting the electrons and atoms in my hand are repelling the ones inside the chair, creating a repulsive force, not allowing my hand to pass through the chair. Because honestly, atoms are 99.999% empty space. And so what that means is atoms are mostly empty. There's nothing there. The only thing we have is these electromagnetic fields that give us the illusion of separation and, and solidity. And so if I can obtain the atomic frequency of the vibration of the atoms in this chair and make my hand match that frequency, I would pass my hand right through the chair like it didn't even exist. So so there's probably people, beings, maybe on other planets or maybe even here now, that have learned this technique. We're going to match the frequency of this wall and just walk right through. Imagine a military puts on a special suit that can match the frequency of a solid, solid concrete wall and walk right through the wall. It's going to look like magic. It's just technology, you see? They understand how to match frequencies. If I took all 8 billion people on Earth and took away the empty space in their atoms, I can fit every human being into one sugar cube. There's nothing here. (laughs) We're not even here. That's how, it's really our higher selves. See, our consciousness doesn't exist. It's not created by the brain, I should say. It exists, but it's not created by the brain. It exists in a higher dimension. It doesn't, it doesn't, It's here in the third dimension now because it's inhabiting this avatar body, but it's coming in on a screen, on a beam of light, on on an invisible beam. It's 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 we're we're inhabiting it's inhabiting this avatar body. If you understand that your body doesn't create the consciousness, it downloads it. And what downloads it into your body? You have your neural correlates of consciousness, which are three giant neurons that wrap around the inside of the skull like a giant crown of thorns. Sound familiar? Everyone walks around with a crown of thorns in their head right now. And then you have your neocortex in the front, which is for spatial and higher reasoning. And then you have your magnetite crystals. Uh, And so those three things together harness and hold in the frequency that is you, that is saying, you know, this is who I am. And it allows you to inhabit temporally, time, temporally, this avatar body until this avatar body gives out and ceases to operate and exist because entropy and releases that spirit energy back into the source where it will then be recycled once again somewhere else. And so this, um, the understanding of this is is just so powerful because you got to understand that you are already eternal. We're already eternal beings. We're, 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 when you talk to yourself, you're talking to your higher self from a higher dimension. You're speaking to yourself in another realm. We are all supernatural, eternal beings. A lot of people are trying to fight to become eternal, but we already are eternal. We've already been here for eons and eons. There could be people that you know that look like kids that are ancient. And there also can be people that are older people that are newborn babies, spiritually. Could be their first time arriving here in this energy format. You're talking about old souls. Old souls, right, exactly, old souls. There could be a kid that could be ancient, could be eons old. And there could be a, a lady that could be 70, that could be brand new. First cycle here, first time, first time operating in this energy, in this spiritual energy, in this dimension. Uh, you know, so it's just, it's a lot to grasp. I know I threw a lot at, a lot at you at once, but <laughs> it's such a huge story. I think it's really amazing. For me, it makes me feel more incredible. I feel like I'm part of something super massive and big. I don't think it makes me feel small at all. I feel like because everything is connected, that everything is me and everything is you. 
If I'm talking to you, I'm really talking to myself. There's only one consciousness that exists. Well, that, that was actually a question I wanted yeah. to ask you. Do you think that we share consciousness? Absolutely. Well, then, <clears throat> if we share consciousness, why are there... Why is there good and evil? Why is there? Why are there murderers? Why are there yeah. child rapists? Why, why do all these bad things happen? It's all aspect of one. So if you look even in the Bible, <laughs> God says, I create the good and I create the evil. Do what I say the Lord. He says he creates the good and the evil. Not Satan. He says, I do this. Yin and yang, good and evil. You know, positive and negative. This is what permeates the entire universe. Do you think there's a way to tap into other, <clears throat> I mean, now I'm confused. Okay. <laughs> so if we're all one consciousness, yeah. how can we not tap into each other's consciousness? Or do you believe well, that we can? Well, I just told you earlier, there's a way to hack into other people's minds. Mm -hmm. But let me explain it to you in this way. If you turn on the radio, you can tune into 99.1, 0.2, 0.3, 0.4, You can change the channel. Mm -hmm. All those stations are coming from one source right? A few miles away. And so you have to understand what has been done here. Everything we create is a fractal of what's on the largest scale, as above, so below. So what would a radio be universally? Okay. Consciousness says, okay, I want to see what it's like to experience life in this third dimension as everything that can possibly exist in every format. So I'm going to transmit out these frequencies, 99.1, Billy Carson, 99.2, you, 99.3, Jane Doe, 99.4, so, so forth and so on. And so these frequencies are, are encapsulated in our bodies, but they're coming from one source. A slight variance of the rain frequency, a slight dot number off, and you have another experience, you see? And that's what's happening. And so it's a way for the universe to understand and know itself and experience everything from every perspective you can possibly think of, and also possibly for the creator to see, will this experiment um, eventually funnel out or dispense all the darkness and become a universe full of light? Could this be a grand experiment? It's very possible as well. Are you getting into, we're living in a simulation? I believe that we're living in a simulation. I don't understand it. I don't understand when people yeah. say we're living in a simulation. I have yeah. no idea what they're talking about. <clears throat> so if you understand that we're still talking about a creation, right? So mm -hmm. we believe, most people believe that, we believe that we're living in a created universe. I happen to believe so because when I look at the science, the quantum physics proves to me that someone or something created this. This isn't just pop up out of the blue and just, hey, here we are. There's a universe with people in it. <clears throat> so... If you look at the quantum physics and what's been done recently in laboratories, scientists were able to do something incredible. They created an eighth-dimensional quasi-crystal. Now, this eighth-dimensional quasi-crystal, it gave them a glimpse into understanding the third dimension, and this is how. When they position it in a particular angle, it created, <clears throat> excuse me, when they position, position it in a particular angle, it created something called a fourth dimensional quasi-crystal. And when they position the fourth dimensional quasi-crystal in a particular angle, it casts a shadow of a sphere. And the sphere is our universe. So they discovered that we are living in the shadow of a higher dimension. In other words, the angle of a higher multi-dimensional quasi-crystal potentially could be what has created this gigantic sphere we call our universe. And what's interesting about that is this is a shadow, but not a shadow of darkness. It's a shadow of light. It's a light matrix. We're talking about the, tech, the spiritual technology utilized to create this entire realm. This entire realm was created with some type of spiritual technology. And this technology is so incredible. It's imbued with divine matter, divine wisdom, divine knowledge. But it's also imbued with darkness. But what's interesting about the darkness in this yin and yang, it always seems to be a battle against each other. But in the end, for the most part, the light always seems to win. Even if it takes a long period of time, the cycle happens where the darkness leaves and the light comes in. We're sitting in a room right now that's pretty, pretty well lit, right? If I was to turn on something dark, I couldn't make the light dim any. In other words, if I 
There's nothing I can, there's no darkness I can inject into this room with these physical lights that would make this room dark right now. Mm -hmm. But if I turn all these lights off and just do something as simple as turn on the light on my cell phone, the darkness will flee from that light instantaneously. So the smallest amount of light will make darkness flee. And so I, took, I take that to the universal scale because I believe it's all fractal. I believe that we're, it's all as above, so below. And it's all about how many conscious beings does it take before the darkness flees. There's a number that we have to hit. When we hit that specific percentage of number of awakened souls on this planet, that's when it will flee. What we're talking about is we're talking about obtaining Christ consciousness. I get a little emotional about this. Because it's so powerful. <clears throat> Sorry. So we're talking about, <clears throat> we're talking about this. See, Christ never said he was returning. Jesus never said he was coming back. He said that Christ will return. We're talking about this. When every single person gets this right, it's back. And we're back in the golden age. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. <clears throat> you want to take a break? Yeah. I want to tell you about this business venture I've been on for about the past seven, eight months, and it's finally come to fruition. I've been hell-bent on finding the cleanest functional mushroom supplement on the planet, and that all kind of stemmed from the psychedelic treatment I did, came out of it, got a ton of benefits, haven't had a drop of alcohol in almost two years. I'm more in the moment with my family. And that led me down researching the benefits of just everyday functional mushrooms. And I started taking some supplements. I found some coffee replacements. I even repped a brand. And, you know, it got to the point where I just wanted the finest ingredients available, no matter where they come from. And it, it, it got to this point where I was just going to start my own brand. And so we started going to trade shows and and looking for the finest ingredients. And in doing that, I ran into this guy, maybe you've heard of him, his name's Laird Hamilton, and his wife, Gabby Reese. And they have an entire line of supplements with all the finest ingredients. And we got to talking, it turns out they have the perfect functional mushroom supplement. It's actually called Performance Mushrooms. And this has everything. It's USDA organic. It's got chaga, cordyceps, lion's mane, miyataki. This stuff is amazing for energy balance, for cognition. Look, just being honest, I see a lot of people taking care of their bodies. I do not see a lot of people taking care of their brain. This is the product, guys. And so we got to talking and our values seemed very aligned. We're both into the functional mushrooms. And after a lot of back and forth, I am now a shareholder in the company. I have a small amount of ownership and I'm just, look, I'm just really proud to be repping and be a part of the company that's making the best functional mushroom supplement on the planet. You can get this stuff at LairdSuperfoods.com. You can use the promo code SRS, that'll get you 20% off these performance mushrooms or anything in the store. They got a ton of good stuff. Once again, that's LairdSuperfoods.com. Use the promo code SRS, that gets you 20% off. You guys are gonna love this stuff, I guarantee it. Hey guys, let me tell you about this subscription service that I've been working real hard on called Vigilance Elite Patreon. Basically on Patreon, we have it broken up into three different tiers. We got tier one, tier two, and tier three. Let's dive in. Our tier one patrons get all the behind the scenes footage of the Sean Ryan show. That could include behind the scenes photos, that could be side conversations that we have in between breaks, that could be specific questions that our patrons give us for the guest on the Sean Ryan show and a ton of bonus content that doesn't really fit into any specific category. 
For our tier two patrons, they get access to our tactical training library, which consists of well over 100 videos. We've broken those videos up into separate categories, and those categories are rifle fundamentals, pistol fundamentals, drills, tactics, driving, gear and weapon setups, and everybody's favorite, mindset. Also on Tier 2, you will get a live update from me on the 1st and the 15th of every month where we talk about the upcoming guests on The Sean Ryan Show, plus all the benefits of Tier 1. Our top tier, which is Tier 3, gets full access to all the other tiers, plus they get full access to me where we do video teleconferencing, VTC, once a month. We discuss anything from tactics to current events to who's coming on the show. I take suggestions and it's very interactive. No matter what tier you choose, the support is greatly appreciated and it is the only thing that makes this show drive on. So thank you for all the support. See you on Patreon. All right, Billy, we're back from the break. Okay. <clears throat> we're talking about shared consciousness. Yeah. While we were talking about that, I had a thought pop in my head. I've, like I said, I've been diving deep into yeah. all of this stuff. Yeah. I hear a lot about the multiverse mm -hmm. and that there are, they now believe, this is everywhere. Yeah. I'm not making this shit up. Yeah. They believe that there are multiple universes out there and they've actually found the edge of our universe. Yeah. Can you talk about that for a little bit? Absolutely. Not only did they find the edge of our universe, but they also found what seems to be a merging part or the beginning part of another universe overlapping slightly. Really? Yeah. This is, you can look this up. This is pretty interesting because now it proves like, wait a minute, there is a multiverse. And so we're not the only one. So what happens at the other side of a black hole? Could it be a white hole? So as energy is being sucked out of one universe, is it going in and creating another universe from scratch. Is that the Big Bang? You know, where the energy is coming from? All these questions start to pop up and arise, but I do believe that we're living in a soup of universes, like we're just one of many universes. I think it goes many levels. First of all, I believe we're in a fractal holographic universe, number one, which means that we're not even close to base reality, that there are realities that have been created and created and created. Give you an example real quick. So, and then I'll go into the multi part of it. We have video games, right, that exist. One is called No Man's Sky. No Man's Sky was created by like 14 college kids on one DVD. It has 80 quadrillion planets. The game never ends. And unlimited numbers of life forms as they travel throughout this game. The game never ends and life forms uh, evolve and come into existence and everything else. There's a universe on one DVD. Now what happens if you put AI on that software? then those beings become conscious and those animals become conscious. Another game that's, that exists is uh, The Sims. The Sims are people that have jobs, go to work, have babies, go to parties, hang out, and all this kind of stuff. That's the video game. They're talking about putting AI into The Sims. They're gonna become conscious. Now what happens in The Sims and this other game, No Man's Sky, when these people become conscious from the AI and then write their own programs inside the program and create another conscious universe? and another one, and another one. So the universe could be many, many layers deep. And that's just a hypothesis, but what I'm saying is we may not be in base reality, being that we could have been created by an ancestor of another universe. And how many of these multiverses exist out there? And I believe also that in each universe, based on just understanding quantum physics and quantum mechanics, there's a doppelganger, potentially, of you in a lot of these universes. So you exist. Every potential outcome ex of you exists in every universe. So in some universes, you're not sitting here talking to me because this is not even your career. You, could, you might still be in the military in another universe and so forth and so on. You see, all the, potential, all the potential outcomes that you could think about actually play themselves out in the multiverse. And so what's pretty interesting, even if you travel back in time, like I said, you shift into an alternate timeline. I believe that you shift into another universe. Something very similar to your own, but not the same one you were on. That's why you can't affect the future. And so this multiverse talk, it gets really, really complicated. But what's interesting is 
There's a meditation technique that is even taught on how to tap into knowledge and information from the multiverse, going and finding a doppelganger of yourself that has the answers, that, that's doing things that you want to do, that maybe has found his or her passion, and learning, taking a peer in to peek in, almost like remote viewing in a way, to figure out what that is and then bringing it back with you and utilizing it here, and which is a pretty interesting, um, a pretty interesting use of uh, setting the mind outside of space and time. Uh, and so these multiverses uh, that supposedly exist and they bounce off of each other. And it's like this sea of multiverses, according to theoretical physics. Physics, But I believe that all of each one of these is potentially an experiment that's running concurrently. In other words, this one is an experiment with these laws of physics and this amount of darkness and this amount of light. Let's see how the darkness gets taken out of this one and how much can the light can take over and turn it into a glowing light universe. Light meaning positive energy. Uh, this one over here, let's change the laws of physics a little bit and let's do this over here. Let's start all with light and a very little bit of darkness and see what happens there. Let's see if darkness has the power to take over. I'm just, I'm just hypothesizing now, but imagine this on the grand scale, this soup of universes all over the place and each one running its own individual experiment. To what end, I don't know. Again, this is just a hypothesis, but it's very, very possible that that's what could be happening. And I really feel like this one that we're in is an experiment to see how we can actually destroy darkness maybe once and forever. We know that we're living in a cyclical civilization that rises and falls. We know that based on ancient texts and tablets and ancient accounts that there have been golden ages on this planet before, at least four of them. Now we're heading into the fifth age, which is the age of Aquarius, which starts in 2025. And we're heading in through the, the Yuga cycle, which now I believe we're in the Tetra Yuga, heading back into a Silver Age, heading back towards a Golden Age, which will take thousands of years, but we're on the right track. However, what is stopping us from staying in a Golden Age? Four times we've had a Golden Age. How come we keep falling back down? What is stopping us from staying and maintaining the Golden Age? There's nowhere that I've ever read in any book, text, scripture, papyrus, cylinder scroll, anything that says you have to fall. It just says, the cycle happens, but what if this civilization is the one that rises and doesn't fall? What if we're the ones that really truly learn what happened in the ancient past and we're able to utilize that knowledge and that wisdom because the past is prologue to stop the fall of a golden age in the future? That's my ultimate mission. That's my main objective. How do I help usher mankind back towards that age? I'm planting seeds of a tree that are gonna grow. I'll never sit in the shade of those trees. But the work that I'm doing, I feel, will have some impact on the golden age. Fascinating. Fascinating. <clears throat> on the break, we had talked a little bit about your time here mm -hmm. and making the best use of it. Yeah. Can you, let's have that conversation again. Right. Well, you know, you have, you have to understand on a geological time scale, human beings have been here for less than a blink of an eye. Not even a blink, less than a blink. When you look at the grand scale of time, in the universe, right? I mean, think about it. our sun is, is uh, five billion years old. It's, it's a, it's a middle-aged sun. It only has another five billion years to go. But human beings have only been around for like Homo sapien, 200,000 years. So you can't even, it's just the numbers are, the numbers are crazy. However, you have to understand that when I say a blink of an eye, I mean like we have got to do what we're supposed to do here in a very short period of time. Our lifespans are very short, um, and they've gotten even short, shorter due to everything else that's going on that we've allowed them to do to us. And I do mean we've allowed them to do. They haven't done it against our will. We've allowed it to happen because we outnumber them. And we've got to take back control of who we are, what we are, and our true power, and realize we're here to complete a mission. And the ultimate mission that we're here to complete is to bring heaven to earth. This could be part of the experiment. How much of uh, people, how many people can we help, assist, show, show uh, service to others, to love, to make sure that everyone's okay, to not let, allow others to be oppressed and suppressed? Since we have the numbers, we have the numbers in our favor. How much can we help to change a global economic situation and, and push mankind back towards this golden age and bring out the technologies that are needed to sustain this planet in a way that's green and that everyone can prosper. 
we have a very limited amount of time, and I believe that this experiment resets itself. It's just like a video game. Oh, uh, they failed this time when they got to this level. Now, okay, they only sustained for, I don't know, 10,000 years, and here comes the fall again. Let's see if they can do it again. Let's see if they can sustain it next time. And this four times we've gone through this cycle. We have less than a blink of an eye to figure out what we're supposed to do here. And everyone thinks it's supposed to wake up, punch a clock, go to work, come home, go to sleep, and do it all over again until you die. But that's not what it is. I believe. The mission is how do we create heaven here? Instead of waiting to die so you can live, how do you live now? How do you maximize what we have here now? And if we can do that, we prove something to this system, this grand divine system that says, oh, they're ready for the next level. And that's what I really believe is going on. You know, I, I'm gonna be honest, I think that's a great place to end it. I mean, essentially what you're saying is be a good person. Yeah do good things, leave this place better than you found it. That's it, man, right on the head. And uh, I mean, there's no better message to end with than that, right? Yeah, that's right. <clears throat> well, what do you got coming up soon? Oh, a lot going on. Um, we just had the first annual Forbidden Conscious Awards and it was a success. We're having the second uh, annual Conscious Awards coming up next August, 2024. And you're gonna be one of the nominees. I'm claiming it right now. You're gonna be one of the nominees for Podcaster of the Year. Uh, and uh, it's an amazing event. Next year will be a three-day weekend of incredible, uh, incredible weekend of, of great things going on with great people, everybody on the same frequency. And I have a big uh, workshop coming up. It's uh, my Blueprint for God Power workshop that I'm going to do with Dr. B. Serious uh, in October. It's going to be another mind-bending workshop. The first one, we had 10,000 people that tuned in for 11 hours straight. And this time, it's going to be probably 12 hours straight of incredible teaching techniques and information and knowledge that they'll never be able to see on YouTube or anybody else's channel or TV. This is straight wisdom and knowledge straight from the source. So they got to tune into that. It's going to be amazing. Other than that, just doing our global tours, Egypt, Cambodia, next year will be Turkey. We'll do a, a whole Turkey tour, uh, another Egypt tour, and probably Mexico, or either Peru. Uh, and of course, just uh, getting everybody on that Forbidden Knowledge TV and letting them get a chance to binge watch conscious television instead of binge watching the fear porn that's on the other stuff. Very cool. Very cool. Where, do, where can people find you? You can go to 4bk.tv, the number 4bk.tv, or at Forbidden Knowledge on every platform that exists, and you'll find me. Perfect. Well, I appreciate the invite, and uh, I can't wait till next August. I want oh, yeah. to see those awards. and Absolutely. And, uh, It'll be cool to be there and take part in that. Oh, it's going to be amazing, brother. Well, Billy, I really appreciate your time. You have blown my mind here. <laughs> I got a lot to think about, and uh, I'd love to get you back at some point. Oh, got to come back. This is mandatory. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate you, man. Hey everybody, I'm Sean Ryan. Click here to subscribe to the Sean Ryan Show YouTube channel for the hottest and most compelling interviews that you will not see anywhere else. I've also made a playlist of all the previous SRS episodes so they're easy to find. You can find that right here.